to be re recorded. Um, so I've I've started um, a recording. Um, I give another minute. A couple of people are still are still sort of coming in the in the waiting room. I have to keep an keep an eye on that. Um, okay, so. I will get started. So I, my name is Michael Buser, and I work at University of the West of England, and I'm organizing today's uh, seminar on the art of healing, uh, a research project that has been conducted in, uh, in, in Kashmir with a number of different partners. And um, today you'll hear about quite a, a number of different perspectives on, on the project and about our, our research and where we're going with this in the future, hopefully. Um, there is an um, agenda. If you are interested in in seeing that, um, I put it on the Art of Healing website, and I will put a quick link to that if I can find it. So uh, let's have a look. So I would just link that that way. Um, we can keep an eye on 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 this, and you can look at it in your in when when you'd like. And put it in the chat. So that's the 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 link to to our our agenda. Um, very quickly, I will show you what we're planning on doing. Uh, we have a few talks uh, from different perspectives in the, uh, in the first sort of hour or so. Uh, and then we're gonna take a little bit of a break and then we've got a few more talks and then we've got an open discussion at the, at the end. There will be time for questions within each, after each presentation, hopefully. And I would try to remind the presenters to, to, um, to go to to leave some space at the end for questions, so I'm going to come back in a minute and talk a little bit more about the project. But at this point, um, what I'd like to do is um, introduce Farouk Fazil, who's the founder of the Dolphin School, um, which is the school that hosted us in our research and our activities in in um, in Pulwama. And so so at that, I'll just let Farouk sort of introduce himself and. Um, and some background on on the project, and you'll have to um, unmute yourself. I think. Esteemed guests, dignitaries, good morning. Who are in UK and good afternoon? Who are in India? It's really a great matter of great privilege and honor for me to be a part of this event. I would like to compliment all the stakeholders of the Kalakar Kasba who put their efforts for making this journey successful. It is not only a source of encouragement for us, but also recognition of our hard work and efforts that we had put into setup of these types of programs in very difficult and challenging times. So my name is Farooq Fazli, and I belong to Pulwama, Kashmir. It is the South Kashmir of the area of the Kashmir. I am an educator and an institution builder. I'm a passionate learner. I'm advocate for just and systematic schooling lover of innovation and arts, an artist and a poet. I want to give you some information about the area and what's happening in Kashmir and what's happening in, the, in our area. So especially the youth of 15 to 35 years of age comprise of 40% of the state population. The past three decades of turmoil has resulted in disruption of normal functioning of democratic institutions, including economic and educational. Youth have suffered a lot and missed the opportunity of acquiring quality education, training and skills that are the prerequisite for functioning in the knowledge economy. Due to the turmoil in state, the majority of youth have not had the opportunities of acquiring quality, skill education and physical fitness and excellence in games and sports. <clears throat> Thus, they are not educate, empowered to realize socio-economic goals such as to improve the quality of life. Children who are going, growing up in an environment filled with tension, violence, and hopelessness. 
I want to quote some important things which everybody knows that after August 5, when abrogation of Article 370 happened, curfew was imposed for more than six months with no phones, no internet, and no relaxation in curbs. While as in other Indian states, the university college and schools are reasonably calm and cool, peaceful, which enables the students to successfully pursue their studies in, and enter into the world of work with great success. In my opinion, education is a process of learning from one's experience. Being in the field of education, so let me share some important experiences of my life of the students. You know, the day of every student started with one thing, with some questions. Whether schools are open or not? Is there any curfew in the area or not? Can we go to school today or not? These are the set of the questions which every student asks their parents because they know that every day is a new challenge for every person in the valley. The students are coming from the areas where people celebrate death of their own loved ones. Lack of relevant avenues to prove their worth, otherwise have dead children towards picking up the arms. Because there is no recreation centers, there are no like supportive uh, atmosphere where they can come out of this trauma. The, this urge of armed resistance puts children in Pulwama at risk and losing their lives to violence, which I have closely seen and we have a worst experience of these things in our area. It is imperative to break the loop of violence. This is a very big question for everybody. So how is it possible? So I think that trauma and purposes is order for the children to see opportunities beyond disappear. Effective students spend not only, not more than 100 working days in the schools, as opposed to the average of 180 to 200 working days in the academic year. Because of the non-availability of working days, what other schools are doing or what the procedure of the schooling is that the majority of the teachers want to complete their syllabus in time. Because the students are going to appear in the board exams and they have like different types of other possibilities like to prepare them for this board exams so one thing is very important which i want to everybody to focus on this that our country has been continuously making education policies from time to time to shape the future of our nation and the citrus put on education it's sufficiently educated even in british india <clears throat> educational acts and commissions were set up to streamline education University in Madras, Calcutta, Bombay came into existence during the rebellion period. Such was the anxiety about education in British India, even at the time when they were facing a crisis of their very existence. During the Second World War, even when the war was on, the British government set up an education commission to decide what would be the nature of education during the post-war period, so that the new society that will come into being will be capable of facing all the long time ills created by the war. Unfortunately, in the valley, the bureaucracy in the education sector is either very slow or negligent of the student interests. The governing bodies were never serious to come up with educational reforms that can subside the impact of the long going turmoil. Actually, uh, under these circumstances, when government is not serious for these things, so it's very important to come with a vision, to come with a mission where students can come and explore their areas of interest. So my experience in this field or what type of education, like what I am doing right now is trying to break the loop of violence and subsequent trauma and purposelessness how to make youth emotionally and physically secluded adults, who can be the role model for transformation and accelerate movement towards it. We wish for children in Pulwama to have the gift of exposure and to see opportunities beyond disappear, for students to realize a vision for themselves and the valley. They would raise creative voices in response to violence, start outreach, help and support projects, 
creating an opening space for inviting space for cultural dialogue, practical and constructive exchanges within the community. Empowering immediate and extended stakeholders of schools to rise above their challenges. And we need to give them opportunities to co-construct alternatives for teachers to be uplifted with equipped with sickness to inspire the school leaders and teachers to see schools as an instrument for the change they envision for the valley and for the system of education at large. We also want to feel, feel the parents more proud that they are educating their children in Kashmir, which is very important because most of the parents are sending their wards outside the Kashmir for good education because Kashmiri people never compromise on the education. Especially in the next two to three years, I wish to extend ongoing projects to a larger community. In an inspired state, children of various schools in Pulwama will identify problems in their community and become active disruptors and change makers. Teachers will have the skills to work as scientists, explorers, and designers to create more relevant and meaningful environment for children to flourish in. I hope projects like Kalakar Kaspa will help our students to get involved in transforming their actions into positive outcome. I want every stakeholders, not only the Kalakar Kasba team, but also the who are in the field of education, who want the transformation should be there, who want that student should not be the victim of violence, who want that student should be a part and parcel of this community as a team leader, as a leader. So to please come and join hands with us and see that students should come out of this uh, stress trauma. And I'm, I offer all people who are on this platform right now, you can provide us a lot of support by your like uh, experience, by your talks, by your like the support to sometimes your material can support our students also. So I'm very thankful to Michael and his team that you have given us a chance once again to be a part of this uh, project. And I hope that the, we can be really a role model for the other institutions, for the other organizations, for making change and for making transformation among the students. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Farouk. That was, that was fantastic. And, and thank you for in introducing um, introducing the context and and all that. And also, I've noticed that you you, you refer to the project as Kalakar Kasba, which is uh, how we titled it locally within the school um, uh, for the funding application and for our sort of academic circles. We call it Art of Healing, and that's where the, the website is. And you can we can um, we'll definitely talk um, more about that as as we go forward. Thank you very much again, Farouk, for that. For that. Um, it's very inspiring uh, what's happening there in Pawama at your school. And we're very thankful for you inviting us to participate and to work with the students um, at, at your school. What I'm going to do really quickly is, is introduce the research project and then and then be quiet and start passing passing uh, the baton over to to uh, others who were you know, more intimately involved in in the delivery of, of the work. Um, so first, I just want to mention that this is the Arts of Healing and Kalakar Kasba is a, is a research project that was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council here in the United Kingdom. Um, it ran for about 18 months, really, in total uh, during 2020 and 2021, and our intent was to uh, explore the role of arts and art therapy to support the mental health of children uh, who are living in, in Kashmir and affected by, by conflict. So this, um, we also uh, positioned it as an urgent project. We situated this as um, actually responded to, to a call that was looking for projects of urgency. Uh, and we explained that, of course, with the um, revocation of Article 370 and the lockdowns that were going on in, in, in Kashmir and that, that the children were being um, negatively affected by, by all of this. Uh, and there was an urgent need for us to, to work with them and to provide support uh, for their, their well being. Um, so then the project also builds on a lot of existing collaborations, which I, I think are really important to why it's worked so well. So, first, just to mention that Lorraine Leeson, who's a Middlesex artist, 
uh, Middlesex and London-based artist who you'll hear from uh, as is a friend and colleague of mine. Um, I've worked with Anna, Anna Rupa Roy from um, the in, in Indian artist and um, puppeteer in previous projects in in Rajasthan. Uh, and Anna Rupa has contacts with and relationships with uh, other artists, obviously in India. Um, and so a huge collection of, of individuals who sort of already knew each other and working and and put our put our attention towards towards this challenge. Interestingly, the most of the new people I met, many of the new people I met were here at my own university. Um, so really fantastic new relationships were, were created um, at my own university um, in, in terms of uh, expertise and exploring the role of the arts you know, for, for well-being and children. Um, there were three general phases to our project. There was a bit of a planning and, and, and startup. There was the delivery of arts activities, and then there was a series of exhibitions and outreach. And you'll hear all about uh, different elements of that during, during, the, uh, um, during the talks. Importantly also, we want to explore um, what is the actual impact of the role of the arts and art therapy on children in these contexts. So there's been quite a number of different uh, evaluation approaches that we, that we took towards uh, monitoring that change. So we, we had a huge suite of activities that we, we employed to understand um, the role of the arts in, in, this, in this context. These included various well-being uh, measurements about behavior in the classroom, about uh, emotional development, different kinds of coping mechanisms, the ability to express and communicate, their bodily comfort. Um, so a, a number of measurements uh, were put in place to help understand that um, and to be able to report back on, on the impact of, of, of the arts in these cases. And you um, individuals later will talk about those, some of those specific measurements. The one thing I will say without uh, highlighting the, the sort of the findings uh, as which will come as we as we sort of talk about this project, which is now you know completed um, at this stage at least, um, is that children that we worked with are on a trajectory or were on a trajectory towards increased well-being through the activities, and there is an there is evidence of 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 improvements in a number of different ways, um, and particularly inspiring was a sense of hope and belonging and collaboration that the, the students uh, expressed um, and working with uh, their colleagues and student colleagues at the Dolphin School, but also um, with other institutions in, in India, which, um, which has been about expanding the, the project. So um, where are we going? One thing now that the project that this particular funding stream is over, we are continuing to work together to find um, more funding and more um, ways of, of, of doing this activity. Um, so that is, is ongoing. There are collaborations that have been established that will, will continue as we, as we go forward. We're developing tools and mechanisms that can be replicated and applied in, in other, other contexts within Kashmir, as well as other parts of India and internationally. We're setting ourselves up as a sort of uh, social enterprise or charity that would help, that would be able to do this elsewhere. And we're developing that, that expertise. Um, so anyone interested in, in, in exploring these, these ideas, uh, collaborating, looking at future opportunities, we more than welcome your, your comments and your contributions and your, your suggestions and, and so on. Uh, just to finally say for me, I'm incredibly proud of the, the project. Um, a huge thanks to everyone, everyone involved for the school for, for, for you know, having the, um, you know, the foresight to see this as an important need and for allowing research to take place on the school for all of the artists and the, as who essentially were um, leaders in designing this, this research and the research and academic teams. Um, it's really been absolutely amazing. Um, so you will hear from, from all these individuals as, as, as we go um, and you'll see uh, some of the outputs and, and the experiences that, that we had. So I think that's, that's all I am, am going to, to say. And notice I'm, a, I'm trying to keep to a schedule and stay behind. Um, I will keep questions for maybe Farouk and for myself or just sort of general stuff um, towards the end. And we'll try to plow through until we get to uh, more specific um, discussions. Um, unless anyone has a, an incredible burning uh, desire to ask me something or have some sort of clarification, um, I, will, I will stop there. You could just uh, maybe raise your hand if there's something or, uh, or, or type something in the chat if you do have a, have a question. Um, 
Um, but I think I will. In the meanwhile, I, um, you can you can type into the chat or or raise your hand, and I'll, I'll look at you and and address that. In the meanwhile, I'll turn over to uh, Lorraine Leeson, who's an artist and academic at at Middlesex University, and uh, she will uh, talk a little bit, um, introduce herself, and talk a little bit about the role of the arts in um, in, in addressing global challenges and so on. And I'll just uh, hand it over to you, Lorraine. Hi, um, I feel very privileged to have been part of this project. As an artist, I've been working my whole life from an understanding that the arts have a role to play in addressing social issues. Um, and it's not always easy to get that recognized, but the arts are such a powerful tool. Um, they don't just, uh, they're just, they're not an additional. They are fundamental to how we see ourselves, to how we live our lives. Um, and through the arts, uh, and I, first of all, I would say, I think the arts need to work in collaboration with other disciplines. I think the arts can't achieve anything just on their own, but um, through working with others, I think we can bring the power of those, uh, those cultural tools to the fore. I mean, through the arts, as we've seen in this project, um, you can address issues through the symbolic, through color, through what you might call transitional objects, through fantasy, through revealing and, ad and addressing ways of finding, um, finding a parallel sort of parallel universe, uh, as you will see through this work, where children have uh, developed through stories, um, uh, the issues that have affected them and worked through those issues. So this um, using the arts in this way not only draws on has drawn on the children's creativity, but it also supported a sense of self worth and given them skills uh, for life that are both emotional and practical. Um, so I met um, uh, Michael as he mentioned a few years ago on another research project. So I've been a practicing artist all my life, but joined a uh, university um, because there seemed to be a, a possibility here of taking this knowledge further and enabling things to be done on a wider scale. So we did some work in, in Rajasthan um, where I met um, uh, Anarupa Roy from Kapkata uh, Arts Trust, Puppet Arts Trust um, and other artists. Uh, which was a fantastic um, collaboration. And through that, um, Anarupa has uh, continued working with us, and so has Vikram Sinha, uh, who is uh, an established um, uh, art therapist. I think what's different about this project, it's the first time that I have experienced an arts project being properly evaluated in terms of the effect that it has. So through Michael's contacts at the University of West of England, we have had experts in child and public health, in psychology, in politics and international relations, who have looked in depth at the work that has been done, analysed it, and come up with strategies for evaluating it and understanding it, and eventually that means it can be made transferable. So I think that is the greatest value of this sort of work, which takes a lot of resources in the first instance, but once you've done it, it can then be of benefit to others. So this, the evaluation work, which you will hear from uh, the other academics who've been involved, um, it is so important and uh, I, I will be delighted to, to hear of it. So anyway, thank you for uh, letting me be on this project. I'm so sorry we never got to uh, visit um, you in the amazing Dolphin School that I, I would have loved to have, have met all of you there. But, you know, given that it was the pandemic, I think we, we managed between ourselves and you managed admirably um, there to, uh, to continue this work. So anyway, thank you. And uh, thank you for involving me in this project. Thanks. Thanks, Lorraine. That's uh, fantastic. Um, we've got a couple of minutes now. We've had the few sort of in, in, introductory um, uh, discussions. I just thought maybe I'd take a moment um, before we get into um, the next uh, speakers are, are Vikram and uh, Anarupa, who are going to the lead artists on the project, who are going to talk about um, what what uh, what we've done. Uh, in more detail and specifically, but if anyone has any um, questions or wants to just, you know, say something, uh, clarify or respond to anything that we've said, we, I can, we can certainly um, 
take a minute to 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 do that while while Vikram gets gets ready. Vikram and Anarup will get ready with their content. I'm just giving that that chance there, just in case anyone wants to introduce. I see a hand is up. Um, trying to find who that is. Um, for some reason I can't. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I've got. Go on. Um, there's some. Yeah, I see a, a hand here. I don't. There's not really a name associated. Was it uh, Atelier? Yeah. Go on. Hi, everybody. Hi. 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 My name is Uzma. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Uzma. I'm an artist from Kashmir. I am not from South Kashmir. I'm from the uh, city part of Kashmir called Srinagar, and. I work as an artist and art therapist with special needs children in Gurgaon, which is a few kilometers away from New Delhi. And uh, what I wanted to say here, since we just heard Lorraine speak, uh, in India, uh, uh, not only in India, even in Kashmir, if you're, an, if, you want to, if you're an artist and you want to work as an art therapist, you would certainly, people would look at your degree. They would certainly want to know if you have a degree in psychology also, because we don't have schools or universities offering a program in art therapy, you know, like bachelor's or master's in art therapy in India. So if I'm an artist and I have to work with, I have been working with special needs children for the past seven years, I need to, I am doing a degree in psychology also at the moment because they do look at your, you know, what your education, what you've studied. So just being an artist has not been easy for me. Now I am doing masters in psychology through open school in India so that I can, you know, have this legal, docu legal do documentation where I can tell people, okay, I have a degree in psychology also. I'm just not an artist. So it's been really tough for me. Just being an artist or a painter doesn't work, doesn't help. You need a degree in psychology in India. Yeah, that's thank you. what I wanted to yeah, share. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you for that. And there's a couple of quick things. One I'll say is we actually described our project as um, as uh, arts activities and art therapy. It wasn't exclusively art therapy. Um, right. Um, so so it it was a bit we just needed some some explanation about about what it is we were doing. Um, so it was right. within and with and and outside of of the actual discipline of art therapy. But I don't know, Vikram, did you want to to respond to that really quickly before you know at, at risk of sort of talking about your 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 background at all in terms of that that issue? I um, yeah I, I uh, if you want me to address to it, Uzma, I think there are uh, various courses in India right now on arts-based therapy. And you just, you can ping me a plater and I can tell you there are plenty of them right now. And okay. you don't need an, uh, and you don't need a, a, a psychology background. You need experiences uh, and there are right. diploma courses, there are in-depth work. There's plenty of that. Uh, but this particular project is much more arts uh, because it's a collaborative work with an artist as well as an arts therapist. So it's kind of uh, interdisciplinary and it's much more, it's much more arts and social inclusive. And as, as we yes. sort of uh, look through the presentation, you will understand. But to answer your question, I think uh, uh, there are plenty of spaces now available for the last 10 years. At I'm just trying so to say that, yeah. uh, sorry, Vikram, just, just uh, sorry to cut you off. I just wanted to say, I've been trying to do this since past seven years. I did get an opportunity sure, sure. to work with a school uh, sure, with sure. special needs children as an art, like they gave me a special kind of designation. Sure, I work sure. as an art therapist with them, but it's been seven years now and still not been easy for me because everybody asks, do you sure, have sure. a degree in psychology as well? You know what I mean? Sure. And that pushed sure, me sure. doing master's in psychology. I am pursuing it at the moment. Sure, 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 sure. But I'm just letting you know that that there are there are relativity of experiences, and there is a yes. plenty. Of, I mean, there are there are schools actually, especially men for special children, which are solely yes. run with arts based therapy in Bangalore. We can talk about it yes. later on. I yes, think. I think sure, Vikram. If you could share the link and everything, your connect so, connection. I, I, I think Michael will do that, and 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 yes, I think yes. we can we can connect after the forum, and I can tell you lots of other spaces. In there. Yes, yes, yeah, that would sure. be so nice. Of you. Thank you so much, everybody. Cool. Thanks, yeah. thanks. Okay, great. Thanks. That's that's fantastic. That's a nice clarification. Um, so what I'm going to do now is turn the uh, discussion over to Vikram and Anarupa, who are the lead artists and art therapists on on this project. Uh, really, without them, there's there really is nothing. 
Um, so they're going to spend a little bit more time. We've allocated about you know 30 minutes or so to, to their discussion because really they're going to talk you through uh, what happened and their backgrounds and their experiences um, um, with this. So just very briefly, An Anarupa Roy is um, an artist and a puppeteer who um, is uh, with uh, Katkatha Puppet Arts Trust. Um, who I've worked with previously and, pre and, and, and know quite well. And Vikram is art therapist who's been working in Kashmir for, for, for quite a while and who is our, kind of our, our really our direct liaison to the Dolphin School and other activities there. So I'll let them talk about those experiences. They probably will be sharing a PowerPoint, so hopefully that will work. Um, I'll keep an eye on, on that sort of thing. Um, so we will um, turn it over to you too. So, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll mute myself and see and keep an eye on things here. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm going to start off the PPT and pray that it works. I hope everyone can see it. Yes. Yep. Super. That's fortunate. <laughs> I wanted to hear from you. The moment I looked at your picture, I wanted to hear you. <laughs> okay, uh, Vikram, uh, do you want to start? Uh, we're going to speak yeah. together and we've sort of divided it up. So Vikram and I are going to introduce the project. Over to you, Vikram, then I'll take right. over. So a very good afternoon uh, to this world and a very good morning to that world. Um, Kalakar Kasba, the art of healing. Uh, we have We've specifically called it socially inclusive communities in critical militarized areas like Kashmir because we didn't want to get into this idea that it is either arts therapy or it's just purely arts work. It's a combination and an integrative work of both uh, me and Anrupa. And as it unfolds, you realize that we had the intent of actually creating arts practice among children, um, primarily creating communities. That's why the word kasba and the idea of how healing itself is an art and it's a double entendre here like you know looking at how we can use the arts uh, effectively for um, addressing some deep psychosocial issues so here we can look at that we are looking at primarily uh, you know we're looking at how we can create spaces that hold the collective mind um, we're looking at uh, the idea of a metaphor and to look at how we can contain a um, uh, use a container, primarily looking at what containers do is to create ritualized spaces, to create a space where people can, students can, you know, safely enter and explore themselves and understand how to witness the art and to reflect within as well as to how they can sort of see their own emotions being projected onto, their, onto the outside world. But the most important part here in this particular slide as we go along is the idea of a container. So we created warm up games, we created various sorts of rituals in order to have a, a, to create a safe space where children could enter into the inner world. Okay, can we go to the next one? Yeah, I am just looking at, yeah. Okay, so uh, somehow, uh, Anrupa, I can't see the entire, uh, um, the, the, board for some reason. I don't know why. I can't see, can't see everything. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay. So, so the idea is, uh, so the idea is that when we looked at, um, you know, when I first sort of uh, started work in Kashmir, which was between 2012 and 2019, I needed to look at what the lay of the land was. So I started working with various institutions and to see how institutional settings um, addressed issues where, where in, in a space of uh, surveillance and marginalization, how did children respond in institutions to the various arts? And the idea was these are the various schools and these are the various institutions I worked for a very long time uh, between 2012 and 2019 to get a lay of the land to understand that, um, you know, to, to look at artistic responses uh, among children, to look at how children were responding to, and not only just children, but staff and various other people also, in a sense, adults, how they responded to the arts, how they looked at uh, what uh, the arts actually meant to them, and whether they could express their feelings, which were vulnerable and which were scary and which were intense in a safe way. So the idea of the container and all these ideas, which we later on worked with in a more succinct manner, in these uh, these years, I was working um, using the arts. Yeah. 
next uh Anruko. just a sec So the, how did we engage? How did we enter into the drama? We entered the idea through physicality, through uh, the idea that the, the arts had to be physical in nature. And it, it, I mentioned the word peep here, which basically means through, a, through physicality, they would enter into their emotions. And in, within the in, in emotion, they would move into the environmental space and then reflect it back to the personal. Uh, this was, uh, if you look at this particular image, this is Dolphin School. And um, and this is where I worked a lot in Dolphin School earlier on. And here, this this boy is working with the plaster of Paris in a, with a certain kind of mindfulness to create a certain sustained attention. So we were using many things. And there's more, a lot of exploratory and experimental work to look at how we can create centeredness as well as reflection uh, with children who are often or students who are often very much affected by what was going on externally but how they could go inward and outward at the same time. So this was a method of looking into physicality, through emotionality, through connecting with the environment, and then how do you reflect back into their personal life. And these kind of uh, traits and elements remain throughout as we went along with the, with the various journeys we did. Okay, the next one. So this particular one is an interesting uh, phenomena to explain the peep is this is uh, this is a uh, uh, this is Shajar home and these children uh, are essentially have single parents and they sort of grow up here and I worked using the structures of houses and narrative buildings and think how narratives could unfold and how uh, feelings of anger or feelings of flight or fight or these things could come through various stories and narratives. So these are also the external structures, but also the idea was to bring about a therapeutic goal to create an inner structure. So I think uh, here is where I started exploring and experimenting that whether uh, students could talk about themselves through these kind of uh, narratives, they could talk safely about themselves without feeling threatened. And we didn't have to look at disclosures. So the idea that the arts in, in, in a symbolic manner could talk about very uh, sort of deeper stories in a sense or stories which are coded, uh, the children immediately understood this and brought a lot of the stories out through these kind of activities, uh, through these kind of storytelling. We can't see it here, but there are some stick puppet, paper puppets which are in the, um, in the structures there and which also talk to the characters who lived in the houses. And in this way, uh, I could clearly see that their artistic responses, as well as to their vulnerabilities within, was safely executed through the arts. So this was, an, this was these were all earlier work before we went along. So uh, what did these learnings informed us? Primarily that we could look at um, reassessment of memory reassessment of understanding of what a trauma responses could be in a safe way through the arts, uh, to look at how children could work with interdependence and interconnections with each other, and, um, and that the arts help them together as a group, as a community. We could go individually as well as with collectively within these uh, spaces. We could also look at a variety of spaces as I earlier on mentioned that, you know, um, I worked with uh, a number of institutions and each of them had their own very specific different responses. And you could see that all of them responded very well with the arts and their, uh, their trauma responses in terms of, uh, they could talk about intense spaces without actually getting triggered. So how well they sat on the triggers, how well they were resourced, how, they, how well their uh, sense of articulation and emotional articulation happened. All of this was seen beforehand before we actually moved into the work in Kalakar Kasba, which is in 2009 to 20. Yeah. Right. Now uh, we move into the idea of what a metaphor is. So there are there is a metaphor, there is improvisation skill, there's artistic um, uh, skills. And uh, these are the three kind of elements with which we operate from. The butterfly is, is what we chose. So, so the thing is that uh, something we contribute, something which we actually introduced as a metaphor, and there were various layers of metaphors which came about uh, as we went along with the journey. Anupa, could you go back again to the slide? Yeah. So to, to primarily the idea of the metaphor was, and the use of improvisation was to see that 
we could go and express the children or people communities could express without words and we could bring about the unsaid and the various layers which are there within the metaphor could be expressed without actually um, having to say things. And this was very helpful for children because many a times uh, their vulnerability gets them into a frozen space. And there is a culture of silence. To break the culture of silence, we had these kind of metaphors introduced as well as they would bring up, once they understood the language or they got their own language of metaphors, they started bringing up stories and informed us about their own inner world. So improvisation was a key aspect to bring about various other metaphors. Yeah, the next slide. Now, when we look at the uh, when we looked at the symbolic, the imagined in the real, basically primarily what we what we see here is that the um, symbolic and the imaginary in the real was that the imaginary world is a world they got into in order to um, safely look at their real world. And this was negotiated by the symbolic. And the symbolic was the puppet, was the paper, was the painting, were, were the various sorts of artistic tools which allowed them to navigate uh, the, the real through the imaginary. Yeah, the next one. Here we, we have four axes uh, we dealt with, which, which sort of met in the middle called the belief system. The first aspect, as, axis was vulnerability and guidance, where, which I handled, and the creativity and skills, the axis Anrupa handled, and they sort of met together in transforming belief systems, primarily negative belief systems, which all the lack of dreaming in their lives or when they couldn't see the future, how this allowed them to understand the, the feeling that they could actually create or manifest their own dreams. So here we look at the vulnerability and the axis uh, sort of guidance where they enter into their vulnerability through paintings. Paintings was my, uh, you know, sort of key uh, entry point into the inner world. It was primarily 2D. So we have a 2D aspect and we have a 3D aspect. And now Anrupa will explain more of the 3D aspect and I will talk a little bit about the 2D aspect. So here's the painting uh, as uh, the first element uh, as the painting as a landscape. Yeah. So um, I just want to uh, go back to the butterfly. You know, uh, the butterfly was a symbol which we sort of represent. And as you saw the half made butterfly, because there was a collective painting, it is like a thread into the imaginary world, which we sort of um, created. And the butterfly sort of led through this imaginary world. You know, it took us on a journey uh, with it. And these are the seven um, landscapes of seven colored paintings, which we did for, uh, you know, the first uh, time when we started working with them, which was on online. So I was working with the colors online, with the paintings online, and then two sets of paintings we did offline. So the butterfly took us through these landscapes. And each of these colors represents a part of the psyche, uh, represent their own emotional vulnerability their temperament. And as they colored through this landscape, they, each of these paintings also threw up a story. So the story was also an expression of their aspects of their mind, which was partly, uh, you know, partly also represented uh, the kind of, uh, you know, feeling world they went through, the also the outer world they went through. So everything became metaphorical. And this is where we started developing a language of the metaphor through the colors. And this is also where they started gaining some artistic skills while painting also. So the seven colors represent the seven lands which the butterfly traveled. And each time the butterfly traveled through each land, a story would be told to the butterfly. So this is how we uh, gave a metaphor as well as received metaphors from the children. So I'll start uh, with the 3D aspect uh, of the project. Uh, one of the key challenges were that was that we were working online uh, in September 2020. And through September and October, we were working online with the children via Zoom. And most of them were on their phones. They were on a 2G connection. Some of us were on 4G connections. So um, it was very important at this point to send them something tangible in terms of a metaphor and this box that you see, this yellow box, it has a little, um, it has the little logo of the project, the Kalakar Kasba, which is a little blue butterfly. And each one of them received a box, which was uh, uh, physically receiving the metaphor. It had all the materials they would use through the process, but it also had a small little butterfly. And the first, uh, while uh, Vikram was running sessions 
with the children and they were painting with him and working with different colors. Uh, my colleague Shamim uh, from Katkatha and I were running sessions where we were doing um, uh, much more tactile, sculptural, 3D things. And the first exercise was playing with this little butterfly that they had received and it would fly through their house and goes to go to their favorite spots. Uh, so the, it was the beginning of an identification with this butterfly. And um, eventually they painted themselves with butterfly wings and they had these little puppet uh, uh, cutouts and um, stories began to unfold uh, through these. Uh, the first story was where the butterfly comes from. So there was the egg of the butterfly and they built paper sculptures. Uh, these are some of the sculptures of the land of the butterfly, the place where the egg was laid. And um, they were asked to create a story of the land and of very interestingly, all of these stories were of crisis, of, of uh, difficulties. There's one image, uh, one land, which was actually a cage. And you see here, there's a river and the little egg, uh, if you follow the cursor, is sort of stuck between these rocks. There was another one with a bridge where the egg is suspended uh, over waves and it's sort of hanging in midair. So there was always very interestingly stories of crisis and these sculptures are all made of newspaper by the children themselves and at this point the children were working individually so it was one um, small groups but individual projects with Vikram on one side and with Shamim and I on one side. Um, then at some point we built this little paper worm this was the caterpillar which came out of the egg uh, and had its own story of its journey uh, and then they built a cocoon, which was inside a box. So this is the outside of the box. The boxes were also built by the children. And this is the inside of the box, which was preparing for, uh, um, for things to come. And this had their favorite food. This had their favorite memories, things that gave them strength. And it had three secrets of the caterpillar, which were little scrolls, which were hidden in this box. At the end of it, the children sealed the box and some of them painted on the box and built a whole world outside the box. And then in November, Vikram was in Kashmir. So Vikram, you should know. Yeah, so the first part of it, when we were dealing with, uh, when we were working with the first half of uh, the project, it was online. And uh, the, even though I had worked with the children earlier on, um, Anrupa hadn't and physically met them. I had physically met them, but a November visit was very significant because I got to really know the children and what they were feeling uh, about the project, as well as they could see them literally with their, with their hands on. And this is a very significant period where I think the project sort of lifted itself up. So I just wanted to give that background about the November visit. Um, the hero's journey is, is where up till now we were working individually and the children were individually working in their little silos, but this is the time when they came together and they had a particular, um, you know, a certain um, a format was given to them of building a narrative, which was designed by this person called Muli Lahad, which was also about looking at their coping mechanisms. And this also gave insights to a lot of the, you know, counselors, academicians, and to see how they build stories. So individually, the children went on building stories, which were then fused in together in, in four stories. And uh, these four stories were based on the idea of the hero's journey. And they were, each of them went on to project that their story into a sort of a storyboard, which you can see here is one of the group who sort of have systematically, and this is where the children actually literally saw their own stories being projected back to them as a mirror. So the idea of the witness, the mirror, the actor here starts getting played quite clearly where the story becomes a reflection of the psychosocial themes, which the children sort of uh, are unconsciously or now consciously engaging with. Yeah, so this is the narrative structure. The, then they start, once they get the storyboard, they start building towards a shadow puppetry. This is, a, this is the first time the stories then start moving and getting into um, a 3D dimensional aspect. And they're looking, they're, they're building here, they're learning new skills. 
and they're learning new ways. And as Muli Lahar talks about, it's a forgotten language. Their imagination is now unfolding. They started seeing that they can actually build something and they can do something. They've been, of course, given help, but uh, this is where the story is taking shape. Yeah, this is the building, this is the cutting. Now, then we sort of, in November, we also, to give them an idea of what it is like to express the art in a public forum, we, gave, we brought the parents in, we created black boxes, like, you know, turn the classroom into an auditorium and the children performed. And not only did they perform here, they learned that they were actually their voices, which were muted earlier on, which many of them hadn't spoken. They got a chance to speak to their parents, speak to the community about the issues they experienced, about what the issues were, what the, what the stories embodied, and they could actually articulate themselves. This was a very powerful experience for them because they, they, there was a sense where a community was being built here you know, a community artistic with an artistic base. They could actually engage with their minds, with their parents' mind, with themselves. And, you know, what it is like, and this is the first time it's ever happened in, uh, you know, in, you know, and this is during the pandemic. And this is the first time it's happened in, in Pulvama. That is it, that a, a private show like that, quiet, quietly, we could sort of talk about very intense issues, which were earlier not, not being discussed. And they are different from the rest of the, uh, main narratives because they were the narratives which people don't talk about. So this unsaid is very clearly brought about through the stories and the children were really appreciated by the parents and they felt really confident. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the key changes that happened up after Vikram came back is that in December, January and February, Shamim and I continued to work with the children online and we could see uh, uh, the change that had occurred because of this physical visit by uh, Vikram. So in September and October, a lot of cameras were worked through. Sometimes cameras and microphones were muted when we were working with children. Um, they were barely present. Some of them would follow the project, but would not participate except for being present. Some would participate actively, but the numbers were small. And as soon as this um, interface had happened, and clearly the three things that have happened had uh, taken place as one that experienced the arts in a tactile manner uh, together in a community, two, they had um, had the, the opportunity to perform and tell their stories, three, it was a performance with a public uh, interface, so there was an audience present which included their parents and their community, and what this, this had done is um, you could we could feel a palpable excitement when we went back to the online sessions because now cameras were constantly turned on. Uh, of course, it helped that um, now some of the places also had 4G. Um, also, a lot of the children were uh, speaking up. Uh, there, were, there were groups in place. Uh, they were very excited about planning. They'd all done shadow puppets. Now they wanted to do more um, with the arts and puppet theater. Uh, so we could feel the change in the dynamic. We could feel that the immersion had changed, the kind of involvement they had uh, had changed. Um, so there were now four projects with four distinct stories. There was the story of the lonely boy. There was the story of the king of Egypt. There was the story of the two sisters and the land of equality. And what is interesting about all of these stories is here the, the hero's journey and the metaphors uh, of transformation we had begun working with were very clearly visible. Um, and uh, the lonely boy, for instance, is the story of a boy who doesn't fit in anywhere, not in school, not at home. And so he decides to go off into the forest and he meets um, a fairy, he meets the devil, he meets the moon, and in the end, he meets a wise tree and decides to come back home. Um, then there's the king of Egypt of the story of a young prince whose father dies and he's betrayed by the uncle. And the story of the two sisters is about sibling rivalry. And um, the story of the land of equality was primarily a group of girls. And it was about a princess who was disinherited by her father because she was a girl. And these stories in these two months um, became more crystallized. And then they began to choose um, the kind of arts they wanted to use in creating these stories. And uh, what was fascinating for me is um, this desire to create, uh, uh, you know, really interesting art projects and the kind of 
enthusiasm that had emerged. So when we were there physically in the month of March and April, the art projects uh, began. And uh, one of them was this um, uh, giant uh, painting on a wall. And this is their uh, maker's lab in uh, the Dolphin School. This is a beautiful space devoted to the arts. All the, uh, all the children from the different classes come here and uh, can uh, engage in the arts. And since the building had wooden walls, we decided to paint directly onto the wall. And this group had uh, this mural with, and this is what you see at the back is the mural, with these little pop-up boxes, which were peep shows where they could look into the life of the lonely boy. So this is, for example, uh, for instance, on the right is him sitting alone in the house. So you have a little house. And here the metaphor again comes in of, of this little intimate world of the lonely boy sitting alone. And you have the moon in a distance, which he can't reach. He can't be friends with the moon. Um, uh, was, was one of the stories. This is what it looked like. There were six boxes. Uh, each of these was built by different children, but the entire mural was painted by the, the, the group together. So um, again, continuing the theme of the individual reflection, the individual art project and the community and the group. Uh, this was the girls group, uh, the land of equality. This was a story which almost became like a scroll or a comic book. Um, and this was a giant mural, which was about 20 feet, which is nine, eight meters uh, by about three meters, um, seven feet. And there was a glass window, which they turned into a stained glass window. Um, what was interesting is when you climb the third floor of the school, this is the first thing that you see by the end of it uh, to have created an arts output, which was um, uh, so uh, finished and so vibrant was something that uh, the children were really, really proud of. Um, and on the last day, of course, there, there were a couple of shows where they presented this to their friends, to their children. And even today, as children come into the school, they can continue to see this um, mural. Um, here are some uh, close-ups of the stained glass window. And the idea was to turn the space of the school itself into stories uh, um, where the magic, the, the, the magic comes from the mundane and the very regular and the very everyday. Uh, also, the, the other two groups, uh, they created, this is the Prince of Egypt and the two sisters, they created paper theater of puppets. And these were where they created their own uh, sets and their own puppets. And now these are two films and I'll share the link to the films uh, with you in the chat box. So when, you, when you're free, you can watch some of these films. They're online, they have subtitles, um, the music, the script, the voiceovers, everything is done by the children. Essentially, we have done the final edit and added the uh, subtitles onto it. Um, so coming to the end where uh, Vikram and I will do this together, uh, I mean, to, to just give you an immediate reflection of the projects themselves, one of the things that had changed is the effect it had on the body of the children, um, from shy bodies, from bent bodies to the, 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 the straightened bodies, just happened when giant brush strokes began to come in, um, the kind of agency that one could see changing within the children, the ability to tell your own story, in a metaphor and to see that transformation is possible in the metaphor and hence it gives you the agency to change your own narrative. Um, and most importantly for me was the collective because uh, uh, it really became a community of the students, of the teachers who were involved, of all of us, Vikram, Shamim and I and uh, Sohail who was documenting and this constant interface uh, where what I enjoyed the more, most is being absent more and more, where the children took over and we kind of disappeared into the background because um, it meant that they owned the project. Uh, and uh, the butterfly is something very interesting, a completely unplanned part of it was um, while we were finishing the project, some of the children had finished quickly and we had this wonderful master carpenter and there was a decision to keep, to somehow celebrate this butterfly, which it now was ready to take flight, but as a group. 
So he created a wooden butterfly for us with all the children painted together. And uh, Dolphin School has this beautiful uh, lobby which you walk into, which has a high ceiling. And very magically, uh, this butterfly now flies above, hovers above um, the lobby of Dolphin School. And that is the last image, but maybe Vikram, uh, you could share some reflections as well. Yeah. I think what, what was what was the most interesting part of of the journey was to discover that that uh, you know we needed to work more with boys and we needed to do some early intervention with the boys because many of the boys uh, the older boys sort of in midway sort of dropped off and then we sort of took a, a you know a decision to to include younger boys and we saw that they were extremely enthusiastic and they really shifted and changed in fact uh, the four stories um, are very reflective because one talks of the loneliness which often boys feel uh, old an older boy brought the story out on how he was marginalized and he felt he couldn't belong and i think his non-belonging sort of brought about this lonely man story the girls were very feisty and they brought about this whole idea of patriarchy and this this anger or against um, a patriarchal system which would not give emphasis to the girls. And these are narratives which are often not necessarily talked about in the larger narrative of conflict, which often subsumes these narratives. And uh, so we saw them coming out. And the third was on sibling rivalry and feud within families, which is also a story everywhere in the world. But here often, but here we got a voice and uh, the, this group brought about that um, story of sibling rivalry, two girls fighting over for a love and affection of the father which is quite intense and dramatic and then another the, the one which was with the only other younger boys they brought about a story of political betrayal and uh, a personal and political loss um, which was very poignant even though it was all very childlike and very fantasy filled prince of egypt but i think the younger kids expressed the idea of what it is to have a political loss and to also have a personal loss through this fantasy, through this uh, imaginary land of Egypt. So we see an extrapolation happening here of talking about some very real events through the fantasy, through the symbolic. And I think they understood it themselves because we discussed about it. We actually reflected on it. We didn't stay with the fantasy. We came out of it and we talked about it and we discussed as a group. Uh, so there were some very, uh, there, was, there were process moments also, and there were also personal moments also. There was also the idea of connecting with the environment, as you can see. So here you see the peep at really at place. We get a peep into this world. We get a peep into this world of which they have created uh, where the metaphor has become real, where through uh, intense physicality, we enter into an emotional, emotional world, we connect with the environment and we come back to the personal. So yeah, I think I think I think this is where we can end. I suppose. Yeah, just uh, the last thing. Uh, this is to to reinforce what Michael was saying is, one of the key reflections we have had is that to make projects like this sustainable, the frontline worker or the teacher uh, becomes right. very very important. And the way forward really is to take this project to a space where trainings for teachers can begin, so that. Uh, artists don't have to parachute in into Kashmir to work. It's teacher artists, artist teachers who can continue to do the work in schools and many generations then can benefit uh, from this. So we will end here. This is the butterfly still yeah. um, at Dolphin yeah. School. So I will stop. I think we've uh, finished our time. Sorry, Michael. That's great. That was perfect. That's um, uh, amazingly on time, which is um, thankful. Thanks for that. But it, and 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 thanks for going over all those in, important elements of, of the um, of the project. Um, <clears throat> at at this point, uh, I will ask if um, if anyone would like to make some some uh, comments or suggestions or or ask some questions for Anarupa and Vikram in in, in particular. Um, <clears throat> And you can you can try and use the hand. There's 60 people, so I'll see if I can use the hand, or you can um, maybe just um, uh, flip on a camera and let me know you're interested in asking a, a question. I'm I'm sure. Oh, okay, there's there's one here. Um, uh, Sheikh Nazir, do you want to ask a question? Uh, hello. Uh... Good afternoon, everyone. I was keenly uh, 
listening to both Vikram and uh, Norupa. And uh, somehow it took me back in time because, uh, sorry, first let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Shaikh Nazir and uh, I work with Health Foundation that's based in Srinagar, of course, working in j &K. So I have grown up in Kashmir. I have seen the situation and uh, why this workshop is taking me back to time because uh, I have been part of such projects that uh, we had uh, tried to do before. Uh, and uh, we, we tried to do something similar. Uh, we, I can say that we succeeded a lot, but then uh, uh, somehow what we do is we then uh, move to other things, move to other issues. And somehow we, we do forget that we still have to sustain on these projects. I mean, uh, even this project, this should not be a one-off. This is really impro important to bring out the capabilities, the, the, the fear that children have uh, within themselves. Uh, it's not the story of only Pulwama. It's the story of every village in Kashmir, maybe in other places also all over the world. So what uh, I've been telling always is that uh, uh, we as adults move on uh, with the things. We try to adjust. But uh, the, a child is supposed to grow. A childhood does not, last for, uh, it does not last forever. So once a child grows up, he loses or she loses those opportunities that, you know, that really help him to help them to watch the nature, experience the nature, experience like this butterfly. Uh, I mean, we do, we are, as adults never care about these things. So my point is that it is very important to keep continuing on uh, doing these workshops at other places, uh, being part of Health Foundation, because one of the slides uh, mentioned this Shehjar home. Uh, and um, I can say that um, I was not at that part, uh, at that time, part of the this organization. But Shehjar is part of Health Foundation and Vikram has worked over here. And I'm really glad to know that and see that uh, the uh, children from Shehjar home had also come out with these beautiful homes and all. I just want to show you something what I was associated with in the past. Maybe uh, some of you will be interested. So these are some of the, the, the stories we came out with. You know, this was a group of workers from India, Pakistan, uh, Japan, Nepal. So this was a, some, some kind of a similar initiative because uh, I'll just read what uh, is like the introduction of this workshop also. Uh, like what we always see is that children are the main sufferers from disasters arising out of conflicts and wars. To develop peace, love and harmony in children's innocent minds for their fellow beings without any discrimination uh, through this picture book. So this was a project called the called Listen to Me. So where, where the focus, of course, um, I, I now have a bit of understanding of this metaphor. The project was like, listen to me, because adults are always deciding for the children, but then we should take time, we should listen to the children and see what they feel and how they see all, all that's going on around, that's going on around in their world. So I'm really glad to be part of this workshop. Mm, there are some of my colleagues also uh, who are attending this workshop. And for the information of all the, the participants, uh, we are running a similar project in, in downtown Srinagar. Uh, because uh, uh, like in Pulwama, it's a village. Uh, of course, th there's a lot of, uh, it's a different situation now. Children's, children cannot go out you know and there's there's this um, there's this uh, element of uh, violence over there and all but uh, downtown has faced it always so uh, and the children so, um, Jake, i just sorry, have to sorry. we just have to yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Going, so i'm gonna i'm gonna cut you off there but thank you for your comment i'm gonna let vikram say something very quickly and then i'll take one more question um and and that will be that'll be it for this for this moment just wanted to say um, um, to the question as to why the work with the boys uh, is, is very important. Number one is 
a lot of boys do uh, take up arms in in, uh, in in Kashmir, and I think they're quite endangered in that sense. They're quite vulnerable. Uh, also, what we noticed were there were there were uh, you know the the general tendency towards masculinity is often like you know to not to to look at the arts as something which is terribly masculine. So often older boys would sort of not look at this and would consider it kind of um, uh, an act of weakness or would also see that they were getting more vulnerable with, with the work. And if they got vulnerable, they were not very comfortable and they would sort of freeze and they would resist. So there was often a lot of resistance from the older boys when it came to painting or creating or dancing or moving or doing anything creatively expressive. And, but what, what, when we look at, when we started working with them uh, uh, when they were younger, they were far more uh, responsive and energetic and, uh, and actually quite imaginative. And they literally felt really good and they wanted to do that further on. So I feel, I feel that, um, and we have also seen that those who engage in the arts, those boys who engage in the arts and engage with their vulnerability uh, with early interventions, they often do not uh, subscribe to notions of violence and they do not pick up toxic masculinity the way um, you know, early interventions with boys often sort of does not allow that to happen. So I think uh, the work with the boys um, with early interventions with the arts is very important because it keeps them sort of, it, it helps them to dialogue with toxic masculinity around them. Yeah. So Vikram, just to jump in point. because it links to the next question. Yeah. Uh, Neil has asked, what was the engagement that you saw from the families and parents? I think with the younger boys, what we experienced is that the parents are a lot more supportive because they don't see that uh, the arts as competing with their academics and their career opportunities. Um, and this is, I think, uh, a South Asian phenomena where parents view the arts as something extra, as something which will waste the time of a child who should instead be focusing on their career and uh, things like mathematics and sciences. Um, so uh, starting younger, uh, one of the key things was that the parents and the families were a lot more supportive uh, with the younger boys and the older they got, uh, this the, the practical understanding of the arts being distraction was very high as well. So there's another question which says, how did the paintings, uh, the online work uh, with the paintings actually work in practice? Well, um, I think when when we were working in online the first time around with very bad uh, internet connections because Kashmir hadn't got 4G yet, um, they would sort of photograph the paintings and send it on WhatsApp. And we found various different creative ways to, to look at the paintings, but the real uh, understanding of what the paintings were, because we had two or three more sets yet to complete. When I went in November and I actually looked at their work and actually we did a whole diagnostic. So the paintings were, were a diagnostic tools which were connected to the, uh, inspired by the Haushka anthroposophical method of looking at how the colors would talk about their state of mind. And we actually sat down and we really analyzed the paintings, at least one whole set. Uh, and I think that that's where the children grasp the understanding what the colors were actually doing to them. And that again, changed their ways they would use their hands. And I think because they painted a lot. So when they were actually painting the murals, it's sort of um, the, their strokes and their uh, way they used their hands sort of reflected that because they had a lot, lot of practice already. So whether they were painting a small sculpture, whether they're painting the wall, because they had all a lot of, lot of the painting had already gone into the system, um, there was a certain openness and certain kind of a flair which came about. The online um, uh, work was an entry point and it was significant entry point because we didn't have any other means but it sort of lend itself to the later work which was required. But then we could go back into, on, when we went back into online again with Anrupa as she was mentioned, it had uh, a lot of things had shifted because of the physical visit. So it was a com combination of both the things which informed a lot of their art practices. Okay, I'm just going to uh, interrupt really quickly here. Um, I know there's a couple, a few more questions. And actually, if you if you type them in the chat, maybe in the meanwhile, Vikram and Anamrupa can can do some some responses to that. Some of the questions that are asked are actually going to be be answered uh, in some of the uh, further discussions. Um, one of the things uh, Maya asked a question about leaving behind 
uh, for further journeys with the teachers. And that's one of the efforts that we've been working on in terms of workbook activities and maintaining longer, um, longer uh, relationships and also in terms of the training of teachers. So it's not just um, always an external artist that, that comes along. So we are um, uh, have various um, tools and, and bits and pieces um, to, to try and try and um, advance advance those. Um, I mean, the 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 suggestions. I think the the efforts that we're we're going on is developing workbooks, online materials, video resources, as well as supporting the institutions that we're working with through through training um, and and explore exploration um, to, together to ensure that 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 they're able to to in, incorporate this this kind of work um, uh, supported by 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 others as well. So. Um, I think some of that hopefully will 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 develop as as we as we go forward. I'm just gonna I, maybe maybe if you have questions, um, keep typing them into the chat, and I'll ask Anarupa and Vikram to kind of keep keep an eye on those and um, and keep going. In terms of the size, someone's asked a couple of times. It's just there's there were 30 children total that we worked with more or less coming and going. A few came in and dropped out. Um, the individual groups were uh, online were about four five ish four or five. Um, that then created those those those, um, and then they they later on merged into some new forms of groups that then worked together in that similar size. I don't think there was anyone more than six ish that created an, an uh, a final uh, project, but the groups sort of merged and changed uh, slightly over over time. Um, great. So um, I hope that um, that that is absolutely amazing summary of of, of what's happened, and it really only. Um, starts to scratch the surface of um <laughs> of what we've been um what's what's happened there but but um i'm i'm hopeful that that you're getting a sense of 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 what we're what we're doing we're going to move on to the um one more presentation then we'll take a a bit of a, a break is i'm going to introduce um nicola holt who is a um associate professor in psychology at the university west of england who was very instrumental in, in, and led on um, developing some of our, our strategies for evaluation. Um, and, um, and so I'll let her just simply, simply talk about that. So if we're starting to look at the impact and the measurements that we, we uh, undertook during, during the project, uh, Nicola will be speaking um, about, about those elements. So um, I'll turn it over to Nicola. And after Nicola, we'll take a little break and have, catch up on, on time. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Vikram and Anarupa, for describing the project so wonderfully there. I'm going to briefly talk to you about our attempts to evaluate the impact of the intervention on children at the school. And the, we did this in various ways um, through art based methods as well. And I'm going to talk about about the quantitative um, methods we used using various psychometric tools to assess the impact. So in this talk, I'm going to briefly describe to you the measures that we chose and why and talk you through the initial outcomes that we found from this project and some of the challenges of the interpretation with this data and, and limitations and advantages of it as well. It was really important when we had discussions as a team at the beginning of the project and worked out how to evaluate this project. It was important to the team to do this in an ethical way that respected the children and didn't cause any extra distress. And so a kind of guiding ethos in our evaluation was to avoid, for example, directly asking children questions about their well-being and their experiences of trauma, for example, because we were aware that this potentially could give a rise to some distress for children, especially when asked to describe information verbally. Um, we also wanted to encourage children to engage in the art activities without the feeling of being monitored and, and introducing a kind of power element of being participants in a research project. And so the measures that we chose were all indirect and non-invasive measures that didn't require the children to reflect on these issues of their own well-being. So on this slide, I have a list of four different ways in which we tried to assess the children's well-being through different perspectives and observations. And I'll talk you through these going around kind of clockwise. We used um, some 
established tests used to look for emotional indicators in standardized drawings so the human figure test which is thought to be a test it's commonly used where children draw a figure of a person and then there are certain signs in this drawing that are thought to be indicative of anxiety conflict or impaired self-identity and this could be used um, as an activity where children are just asked to to do a drawing and then the the artwork is analyzed without asking direct questions about well-being we also um we're interested in work that's been trying to develop observational skills to observe people while they're engaged actually in the act of art making and participating in art or dance or performance workshops so we looked into extending existing measures to meet the needs of the project to observe the children while they're making art and their changes in mood their changes in distraction and engagement with the activities and um, their bonding with the group etc to be rated by um, researchers so that was the second indice and then we were interested in building on work which had developed an art therapist checklist which involved um, the artists working with the children recording their perceptions a few weeks after working with them and then at the end or towards the end of the project writing and recording observations of the children's behavior in indices relevant to the art therapist's perspective and what they were looking for in terms of improvement. So this included, for example, being um, mindful and paying attention to the artwork, being able to use the arts as a communicative tool, being able to engage with the symbols and metaphors which Vikram was discussing and use these to communicate their emotions and feelings. So we had ratings of how well the children were engaging with that, that process. And finally, we looked at the perspectives of teachers and school staff working with the children um, in their lessons and in the context of the school. And this, for this, we use an established measure um, of the child behavior checklist, which looks for various indices of distress and anxiety and depression and rule breaking and aggressive behavior, inattention, etc in children in classrooms. So this, this form was looking more at the teachers um, observations of the children. So in a very different context, and we had that data as well completed um, in around about um, October and at the beginning of the project and then June towards the end of the project. So I'm going to talk you through some of the findings from these various methods that we used. So these, this is an example of um, the human figure drawing task where people, children are asked to draw a person um, just and that's it's kind of very open instructions. And then this is rated according to various indices which are thought to be indicative of emotional distress. So having a very and you can see here, this is one image at the beginning and one image at the end, which seem to have fewer of these indices. Uh, here's another example where again the image was larger, perhaps put together, better integrated, and again had slightly fewer indices at the end of the project than at the beginning of emotional distress. And again, a third one with things like cut off hands or short arms, a slanting figure, um, these kind of um, signs, again, are thought to be indicative of anxiety or distress in children's drawings. What we found um, through an analysis of this um, was that, that there did seem to be through um, two judges looking at the data and coding the drawings, fewer of these signs at time two. Um, and this was a statistically significant effect. So at the first time in the children's drawing, there were no, no drawings that didn't have any of these indices in them. Um, the second time, some of them um, had no indices in and there were fewer indices of emotional distress overall in the drawings. There were several challenges with the interpretations of drawings in this way and problems, which I'll talk briefly about at the end of this section, of course. Okay, the second measure, the observation um, of children's behaviour by the teachers. Again, these were completed um, 
around about October and then again in June at the towards the end of the project. Um, overall, there were some interesting findings here um, and some of them weren't exactly as we expected. Um, and again, I'll talk about possible problems with this measure at the end. We noticed um, that in the ratings of the teachers, they were they were noticing more indices of anxiety and withdrawal. And um, this is um, signs such as seeming to be worried about things, seeming to be a little bit sad or not talkative. These were actually more more common at the end than at the beginning. And but, however, there were significantly fewer indices of aggressive behaviour, so um, getting angry, shouting, this kind of um, thing, and rule breaking behaviour. Um, these were decreased, and these were both significant findings. So there seemed to be a slight increase in expressions of anxiety, but decreases in aggressive behaviour, non conforming, and rule breaking behaviour. In terms of the art therapist's perspective, um, there were significant improvements in functioning and engagement in the art workshops from the beginning to the end. So the art therapist and the artist noticed um, increased ability to attend mindfully to the art tasks, increased cognitive engagement, finding it easier to understand and express through metaphors and stories and symbols. Um, increased ability to communicate their emotions clearly and um, effectively in group situations. And this is associated with the ability to, to communicate well in the groups as well. So all of these indices that the artists were interested in as routes for improvements in well-being were, um, seem to be significantly improved. The final element that we looked at was more challenging because originally we had intended to do this face to face and um, have researchers to observe the children during the art sessions and record their behaviours each week. We sh as we shifted online, we had to obviously shift that online as well. And we um, have piloted just with one of the groups using a video observation scale to try and rate children's emotional um, responses um, their attentive responses during these sessions and their involvement with the group. So we've just did this with um, one group um, in the first um, nine weeks when um, the online sessions were beginning and um, have tried to see how useful this method was in an online format. And again, there are challenges with, with this, um, such as those which Anna Rupa has already talked about to do with internet access, etc. cetera. Um, but we did, there was one kind of interesting finding from doing this initial pilot, which is although some um, behaviors such as in levels of engagement were, um, at the beginning were maybe weaker and there were different findings across students increasing or decreasing. A clear finding was um, that students seem to be showing more indices of being calm at the end of the workshops and less anxious, um, less nervous and um, calmer at the end of the workshops. So um, the workshops themselves seem to be helping to reduce stress in some way in the, the pilot sessions that we've looked at so far. Okay, so there were various challenges with the, the methods that we've used. For example, with the teacher's observations of the children, we aren't controlling for reasons for anxiety increasing due to various external factors in a local environment um, or due to the pandemic, for example. Um, there are different school staff and teachers coding different children at different time po points, which could potentially lead to some response biases. So we need to be aware of these problems when interpreting the outcomes. We were aware when um, looking at the human figure drawings that we needed to be culturally sensitive and interpret draw drawings in line with cultural context. So at this second stage, many children had drawn masks on the, the, the figures. However, covering the face is seen as an emotional indicator. And we decided not to score that because wearing a mask had become normative. We had to be aware of the cultural context when scoring these. With the video observations, obviously it's very time consuming watching the videos back and there were technical issues where sometimes children, we couldn't see them because they didn't have internet access, for example. 
And we're just illustrating how we had a number of challenges with this method, even though we've got some interesting data as well, and that we need to interpret this data cautiously due to this. So here I'll just summarise um, the outcomes of this evaluation, talk about its potential interpretations. So we did find that in the drawings, children exhibited fewer signs of affective disturbance um, in those drawings indicative of improved well-being. The school staff rated their behaviour as being less aggressive and rule-breaking. Um, the artist recognised various improvements in mindfulness, the ability to use the arts to communicate with others in their groups and to express their emotions in a useful way. However, the school staff um, noted that some children seemed to be more anxious and depressed. And why might this be? Well, when we look at the psychological theory about children that have been exposed to contexts in which violence occurs, um, we can see that um, a common way that children might respond is to become more sensitive to potential threats and sometimes develop a hostile attribution bias, showing more hostility and aggression and being more sensitive to picking that up and responding in that way too. And it looks like potentially the art intervention has helped might have helped to reduce this hostile attribution bias seen through um, the teacher's observations of reduced anger hostility. However, when we also look at the stages of recovery following traumatic experiences, um, it can take a long time and opening up to this safe space and feeling able to access one's emotions and explore one's emotions can be the first stage. And in this stage where people become feel might feel safe to explore their feelings, their anxiety, their depression, their anger, for example. Um, these can also become more exposed. And it might be that um, as children have learnt to become a member of a group, feel safe within that group, they might have worked through some of their initial anger and hostility, but still underneath that, they have be opened up to feelings of more vulnerability, of anxiety and depression, which potentially um, still need to be worked through. I think when I was looking at these findings, I thought a useful way to help interpret these quantitative findings would be to look at the children's voice. And Vikram had discussions with the children at the end of their, their, their journey. And looking at these interviews really helped me to try and understand some of these findings. And what I did just as an initial starting point was to look at the children who had the highest reduction of scores in aggression and rule breaking and those who had the, an increase in anxiety and depression to see what that they were telling us in their own words. And there were some really interesting messages here. The ones in blue are from the children who had the greatest decrease in aggression and rule breaking. So number 10 said, when you feel angry, the anger evokes a colour in you. So later that day, I was feeling perturbed by noises from construction work going on at home. So I picked up a sketch pen and I made a man who was very troubled, denoting his inner turmoil with red and the surroundings with green. So my anger got converted into a painting. Another one, number 17. Teenagers nowadays are given to mood swings and personally being short tempered, I could not control my temper, especially when people criticized or scolded me. When I paint, I feel calm and peaceful. And similarly, number 19 talked about painting a girl in red that was anger. The anger that's bottled up in me gets released. I feel relieved, a little bit relieved that at least I got it out and expressed myself or it would just have vested inside. These um, themes of learning how to access one's emotions to express anger were really common in these interviews with Vikram and link into the, the finding of reduced hostility and aggression in the teacher's observations potentially. It was slightly less common but still present this narrative of um, venting anger and using art to help manage the emotions to control anger um, in the children who had the highest increase in anxiety and depression. They also talked um, about art helping cope with and notice the beauty even when things don't seem to be beautiful in number 20 and art helping them to feel more, more confident and build a sense of pride in their achievements as well. So I'm going to try and finish now. I've 
I can't see my clock, so hopefully I haven't talked too much. But just to conclude, I think these two observational tools have been very useful and broadly supported hypotheses showing reduction in effective disturbance in drawings and improved expression through art and reduction in hostile aggression, but potentially more awareness of anxiety and depression, which leads into what um, Anna Rupa and Vikram were talking about in terms of implications for practice and the need for ongoing care, maybe to help children go through and um, further development to help process these these feelings and responses so that's me thank you well thank you thank you Nicola and you can you can um, <clears throat> see how 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 uh, robust uh, and and um, and diverse the different approaches to looking at the project uh, have been just from that that preliminary discussion um, <clears throat> So what I'll do is we're running a few minutes behind, which is sort of expected. Uh, so maybe um, what I'll do is ask if there are any any um, questions for Nicholas specifically about the evaluation, about the process uh, in that. Let's let's uh, ask ask those, and then we'll try and try and catch up on some time. And if I, if you do ask a question, do try to keep it very uh, very tight in terms of um, you know the, how long you speak. So uh, I think uh, Rehan has a has a question. Is that um, you've got your hand up you know, in reality there? So yeah, go ahead. Good afternoon. I am from Delhi, and I am an art therapist. I am from Delhi, and uh, my institution is JDRC SPYM. Society promotion of youth and masses, and I teach them art and therapy because there uh, so many people are uh, uh, vulnerable with drug addiction, drug user, and we have to uh, treat them with our art, like uh, colors and drawing, doodling, sketching, so and so. We treat them with. Uh, uh, sketch and doodling and colors. Uh, so I want to ask uh, when we treat them in case of drug addiction, like drug using, so how can we uh, deal with in this situation in sense of art therapy? This is my question. Nicola, did you, could, do you think you can answer that? Um, yeah, I wasn't sure if I followed the question. So is this about how um, doodling and sketching can be used within the context of art therapy? Because uh, here, we, mm, when we uh, meet them, because they are related with drug condition like drug using and their uh, background related to very um, uh, high drugs like uh, uh, alcohol and uh, uh, smacks and so and so something like that and uh, uh, they feel as a uh, depressive and uh, very uh, sickness in their uh, mood so we teach them art and like uh, uh, drawing doodling and story based therapy like something related so I want to ask uh, which kind of uh, another source we can use with them in art therapy form? This is my question. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I'm not particularly, there is research on the use of art therapy and art interventions with that population that's found it to be useful. And um, I, I'm not an expert on that particular area, but yeah, I think evidence is growing more widely on the benefits of using the art in a range of different populations to improve well-being through things like even doodling and colouring in, in daily life as a, a mindful activity and to help regulate emotions um, to get rewarding experiences like the flow state through engaging in tasks and um, to give a sense of engagement and meaning in life, as well as to kind of express one's difficult emotions. So various different routes and different art forms and ways of using different arts can maybe be targeted to challenge the needs of different populations. So 
Obviously, another route is the, the pride through working in a group and leading up to an exhibition, improving self-confidence through working through others in that way. So there's so many different mechanisms that the arts can be used to target improvement with different populations. Thanks, Nicola. Um, <clears throat> uh, there was a question in the chat. If you, I think you could just link a few uh, yeah. bits of the interpretive mechanisms um, that you used. Yeah, um, I'll link, put some links to research. So I saw the link about the human figure test. We use that because it's a really widely used measure with lots of validation, but all of these measures are also obviously contested and challenged. And um, so there's lots of research on their validity and how we should interpret them. So I can put some links to help answer the question in the chat. Thanks. Uh, was there one more? I noticed that Shaisley has the, the mic on. I don't know if that means you have a question or um, if it's just the mic happens to be on. Um, so with that, I will we'll take a little break. So we are a few minutes behind. Um, but so what we'll do is we'll start, we'll add 10 minutes to our uh, our, um, our our schedule and hopefully try and um, and pick back up a bit uh, some of that time claw back a bit of that time with the presentations if we can kind of try to keep to to our schedule. Um, so let's take a 10 minute break. Um, we'll start back up. Actually, maybe we'll just take a five minute break if that if that be okay. I can keep on the on the schedule closer. So um, in the UK time, that would be. Um, 1050 um, because of the half hour I'm, what is that um, 20 after uh, in India um, so we'll take a five minute break um, a comfort break and and start back up so do please um, get a drink and so on and um, keep asking questions in the chat if that's if that's helpful and we'll keep uh, track of them and we can try to keep uh, keep responding to those as as we go um, so right, so we'll start up in about five, in five minutes at 10, 10 50 with the next presentation. Okay, so I, I'm going to take a, a small break myself and um, uh, and be right back. I'm going. I'm turning the recording back on. I think we are we are back in in business. Ask everyone to um, you know uh, mute up again if you if you can, um, and um, get back onto the schedule. Now, where we're going now is um, 
I'm going to ask uh, Vikram to say a quick quick word. Um, we had a, uh, a project researcher involved with the Dolphin School as well, who who conducted um, research using um, <clears throat> the basic pH coping model that Vikram will will speak of very quickly. But um, it, uh, but it's a she's uh, Afifa is our, our our researcher here. But she unfortunately she has exams today and is not able to attend <laughs> the session. So she politely and helpfully recorded her presentation. Um, so, and it's about 12 minutes, so I'm hopefully going to play it from my computer and everything will, will work, I hope. Um, but I wonder, uh, Vikram, uh, if you're, uh, I'm not sure if Vikram is back, or if you are, um, you say a quick word about Afifa's role. Vikram is probably getting a, a coffee or a tea. Um, or Anarupa, if you were there. Still out. And the last person I'm gonna to ask to say something about Afifa, maybe Farouk, would you like to say uh, something about Afifa before we put her presentation on? Everyone's missing. Uh, Afifa is the first batch from Dolphin International School and uh, she studied there. She left DPS. She was enrolled in DPS Srinagar and was left uh, when she was in class fourth when Dolphin was established. So she was in the US for some time and uh, attended so many programs and uh, was a part of the University of uh, Rhode Island as uh, there was a project uh, held with India, Pakistan, and US. So it was a building bridge program. And uh, she has like uh, attended so many programs like with uh, UNESCO also. And she's like right now doing masters in um, clinical psychology. And uh, uh, like she's the bright student of our institution. And that's why they like uh, she got the opportunity to be a part of this program. So- Excellent. Okay, so I am sharing my screen. And um, hopefully you can see what I'm doing here. Um, and I'm going to um, play a FIFA's presentation. Uh, let's hopefully. Uh -huh. Good this afternoon, work. everyone. My name is Afifa Farouk. Firstly, I really apologize to you all for not being here in person because I'm probably writing an exam right now. Uh, I am working as a researcher on this project and my research focuses on the role of arts in conflicted areas. So um, for this research, I'm using a base, a model which is called the basic pH model of coping and resiliency, which was developed by Muli Lahad, Miri Shachman and Aura Airlon. So uh, this is used as an effective resiliency assessment intervention and recovery model. So if you look at the name or uh, that is the basic pH, it basically the name comes from its six channels or the language for dealing with trauma and building resilience. B stands for belief and values. A stands for affect. S stands for social. Uh, I stands for imagination. C stands for um, cognitive and P it stands for physiological. So uh, for this research, what uh, we've basically done is uh, that uh, the research basically begins with an introduction of the participant by the researcher, that is me, and by the participant themselves. So this uh, we've taken seven participants and we have analyzed their work that they've done over the period of 10 months. Uh, so these are basically detailed case studies. Uh, and uh, while we go through the research, I've given an example for me to make it um, easier for you to understand how the research basically works. So every step is basically an analysis. It's not that one step uh, leads to another, or it's not like it has a conclusion at the end. Every step, you know, it's like a detailed analysis of what the work has done using different uh, methods. So there are basically six stories that we've done per individual. So I'll be giving an example. I'll, I've taken a story by one of the participants. 
Uh, so this is the story that I have taken uh, to understand how the research works. Uh, so this is a story and it's called Journey to Home. So this is a story about a butterfly who's on a journey to look for uh, her home. And uh, it's about how she moves around and asks different uh, creatures about where the, where she can find flowers. So uh, she is basically in a grassland, which is very dry, and she is basically looking for flowers, and there are no flowers there. And then as she moves on, she sees some dried flowers, but then she realizes, oh, they're dry. Uh, and then the, she keeps going and she sees tulips, white tulips, okay? And then she goes on and then she realizes that white tulips is not something that she likes. She would really like her, to get herself some roses. And then she's like, and then she sees a parrot, and then she asks the uh, asks the parrot or uh, parrot where she can find some flower of uh, some flowers. Uh, the parrot instructs her to go straight, and then the butterfly thanks him, and then she sees a bear, and then uh, a pigeon, and then at the end she sees a deer who tells us where she can find the flowers, and then she finally does. Uh, so uh, the rule of the six part story method is used for analysis in the basic pH grouping model. So I have divided the story according to that. So the main character of the story is the butterfly. The task is to get back to home. And then the help uh, uh, is the parrot and the dare. And the obstacle is the pigeon. And then the coping with the obstacle, how she copes with the obstacle is that she just keeps her search going on for the home. And then she finally does get back home. Uh, so here what we do is, and then we assess the story according to the basic pH model. Here what happens is that every single word that has been used in the story, except for a few conjunctions like I am and all that, we basically, every single word in the story is rated uh, based on the basic pH value. So uh, here we can see like the butterfly, the butterfly is uh, would be rated as social or we can see journey. It's something that is physiological. So every single word here is divided based on the basic pH model. And then for the next step, what we do is we count how many times a certain word has occurred. So here in the story, belief has not been used at all. Uh, and then we see affect. Affect is an affect has been used 12 times, and then social has been used six times. And similarly, cognitive 15, physiological 12. The top three, the num uh, the alphabets, like the basic pH, the ones that are used the most, the top three form the apparent language. So in this story, we see that the most prominent used coping mechanisms are C, pH, and A, that is cognition, physiological, and uh, the affect, they're used most. So higher score in C basically implies that the person has a higher IQ and has a fewer cognitive complaints. Uh, so this can be reflected in the child's performance at school where she has been seen uh, has been the topper of the class, a score of 12 in pH translates to behavioral coping and active coping. A combination of pH and C implies that the person is practical and rational. It also implies that the person can plan and perform well. A combination of C and A might imply that the person is emotional, but they're also practical about it. A higher score in A represents an emotional approach to things and can also suggest a higher score in C and can also, sorry, and can also suggest that a that uh, a higher score in C might imply that the person thinks that uh, with their mind rather than their heart. Okay, so the forgotten language is the uh, coping mechanism that is least, um, used the least. In this case, it is belief, imagination, and social. So this can imply that the person lacks belief in themselves. It can also convey that the person gives up easily and that the person fails to draw strength from adversity. adversity. They are also not very social and an S minus proves uh, that they may see others as obstacles. So they're very antisocial and they kind of lack social support. So this was a step that was not really mentioned um, in the uh, basic pH model, but this is something that I felt would be really um, useful in giving the study a quantitative uh, value kind of. So what I have done is I've counted the number of words that have been analyzed under basic pH, and then the number of words are divided by the total number of words, which basically gives us a presentation of how what the total number of words is. So you can visually see that, um, you know, um, 
see as a coping mechanism is used the most. So this basically gives you a visual representation. And this is the set that is used uh, further in the end of the research, in the end of the case, at the end of the case study, uh, to make further conclusions about the work. We uh, basically then look at the theme, like what is happening, what really is happening in the story. The next step, uh, so the basic idea, so then for the next step of the research, we look at the conflict. So this level basically probes into the unconscious of the individual. This level uses a psycholinguistic approach while adapting the psychodynamic point of view. So financial maintains that the neurotic conflict by definition is one between the tendency striving for discharge and another tendency that tries to prevent this discharge. So the symptoms are actions that are taken against the anxieties that underlie behaviors and conflicts in literally forms actions are represented by verbs and adverbs we hence look for all the verbs and adverbs in the story uh, they are then jotted down and uh, contrasted with each other with the opposite verbs or adverbs thus uncovering the opposite intention or conflict the list of opposites reveals the possible conflict so this was um, yet another um, thing that was not actually a part of the basic pH model, but uh, if we were actually looking at the clusters, uh, we look at the 16 personality factors that were given by Raymond Cattle. Uh, so it's based on the trait approach of personality. So there are 16 personality factors that form the psychological clusters um, that are Group dependent versus self sufficient, relaxed versus tense, forthright versus shoot, self assured versus apprehensive, serious versus happy, cool, lucky, submissive versus dominant, affected by feelings versus emotionally stable, trusting versus suspect. Uh, then comes reserved versus outgoing, less intelligent versus more intelligent, conservative versus experimenting, practical versus imaginative, and controlled versus controlled, tough minded versus sensitive, timid versus venturesome, and expedient versus conscientious. So uh, we basically then like we said, we take the verbs, adverbs, and write the opposite. So if we talk about going, the opposite is coming. So it's a cluster. It would come under self-assured versus apprehensive. So this is something that is very subjective. And I thought that these are the clusters that are, are a part of this. So like we see, can see, and cannot see. So for me, it felt for it felt under uncontrolled versus controlled, practical versus imaginative, less intelligent versus more intelligent, practical versus imaginative, trusting versus suspicious. So every single adverb is taken out of the story and a huge table comes out as a form of that. And then we look at individual scores of each conflict where every single conflict is basically numbered, like how many times the given conflict has occurred. Uh, so for the next step, we take the summary of this conflict as in what the top conflict, what is the most prominent conflict that is a part that uh, is happening right now while the person is, you know, writing the story, while the person was uh, doing their story. So the next one is basically the symbols, and this has been taken from Sir Lots. Uh, so every single word that is a part of the story is basically uh, searched for in the dictionary, and uh, it's uh, the meanings are looked for and what they mean. And then supposedly butterfly. So it is the emblem of soul of unconscious attraction towards the light. What really happens then is that every single symbol uh, that we can find in the dictionary. So then using these symbols, the meaning of these symbols is then inserted into the story to make a complete sense to, you know, make to understand what the story really is about based on that dictionary so after we're done with all this what we really look at is uh then for the six different then in order to conclude the work at the end of every individual's six stories there is a different section where every single thing is concluded um so it uh, it has a summary of how different coping mechanisms, how the use of different coping mechanisms has happened over the period of time. For example, in this one, we can see how the use of affect as a coping mechanism has changed. And this basically gives us a visual representation. And we can actually uh, convert this into numbers. Like, OK, so this is how the graph works. Uh, the use of affect as a coping mechanism has increased. And then it has taken a slight dip at the end, but it has it is something that is prominently used. Uh, and there are other conclusions at the end of the story, but due to the short uh, a period of time that I had, I could just uh, summarize my research this much. I uh, would love to hear everyone's uh, 
comments and everyone's feedback about my research. And since I'm not here right now, uh, I would love to take questions and obviously the feedback for this research. And for this, you can email me at afifafazli at gmail.com, A-F-E-F-A-F-A-Z-L-I at gmail.com. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you, uh, Afifa. Apologies uh, that um, that you're not here. Um, uh, if anyone has any questions, I think Vikram is probably qualified to answer the questions uh, on, on that um, <clears throat> on that approach. Um, I'm hesitant to take too many questions because uh, I, I I would like to um, uh, keep keep moving uh, along. But if anyone wants to know a little bit more about Afifa's approach and the basic pH model, um, Vikram would be able to, to speak to that. Um, just give a quick moment. If you have questions, you can type them in the main chat or send something to, to Vikram. Vikram, did you want to add anything else? Just quick, yeah, super just, quickly. You, you know, the thing is that this is very technical. So I don't know how many... Uh, people have actually got it, but what it also qualifies that uh, when that the basic pH model primarily looks at uh, what's the coping mechanism of the child, if it's a B or a belief, or is it an affect, or is it a social, is it an imaginative, or is it a cognitive, or is it physical? Once you understand that this is the coping mechanism of the child, which is, me say, for example, um, you know, social is, a common is is uh, is primarily a coping mechanism. Then the kind of therapy or the interventions you require is to increase the social aspect. So Muli Lahad's basic understanding was that um, you know he was working with uh, okay the backstory of Muli Lahad is he was basically he was observing children in Palestine and he saw uh, children responding to stress to planes being uh, you know dropping bombs saw that there were six responses which uh, the children were giving into these high stress environments. You know, one was praying, one was sort of uh, crying, someone was, you know, um, we, um, drawing. And so basically brought out these six ways, he understood, there are six ways of dealing with high stress. And if you work with, if you discover what is the stress level or what is the coping mechanism of the child, you increase that coping mechanism. And when you increase that coping mechanism, it lends itself to resilience. So this is primarily how we function. That we, if you, even in therapy, for example, a lot of people who are uh, who are non-cognitive types, when they go to cognitive uh, therapy, they often feel very stuck because they don't have the words. They don't have the words to articulate what they feel. They rather draw it out, or they riot, rather dance it out. Or they rather, uh, you know, um, you know, do another kind of a way which is not to do with cognition, you know. And I think Muli Lahad was saying through because he's a play therapist. He said through playfulness, we see, you know, through dancing, a child could express its pain. Through weeping and just weeping or going to emotions, to affect, it would be able to express its pain and express its and discover a language. So the arts essentially have the other five mechanisms other than cognition. And this is something which is very interesting, which Muli Lahad sort of discovers uh, and brings it out that the children have forgotten languages. And when we do this assessment, we figure out that these narratives or these stories of these lands, which the children have done, they are they're talking about their coping mechanism. They're talking about what they would be better off to deal with rather than only chatting or talking. A lot of the schools, for example, they believe that if you have a conversation with a child about discipline, and then I've had several conversations with you, but you still don't listen. And then what this essentially does is that they can't listen because they're, 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 they're not the cognitive types. So when you discover basic pH and you, when you figure it out, the child may be able to understand a lot better with a dancing teacher, for example, who will dance out and they can dance out their problems or they can play out their problems or they can play out their issues and they can talk about without actually talking. So I think this is what essentially uh, the basic pH model of assessment is to deal 
to figure out what is your coping mechanism of the child. I'm just giving you this explanation because I know this is a lot technical, which Afifa said, and I think yeah. it will just be useful. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end, end that. So anyone who has questions on the basic pH model or Afifa's work, maybe uh, send a text message to, to Vikram in the chat. Um, I'm going to move on and um, and turn this over to where we're behind. And this is, I always get, I go into a panic when, um, when uh, I, um, when people, when I go late, uh, so I don't know, it just sort of drives me uh, crazy. I don't know, I get sort of psychotic about it. So here's, um, uh, I'm going to uh, turn over to uh, Emma. Um, um, I'm, uh, I'm not sure why the spotlight's not working for you, but if you can um, say hello, Emma, where are you? Hello, can you hear me? I can. Um, sure, oh, I can thank see, you. see you. Can you not see me? Oh, here we go. There you are. Okay. So yeah. So um, I'm Emma is at the University of Western Virginia. I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm having a little panic attack about being late. So <laughs> okay, I will be. I will try to be very good and be on time. Let's see how it goes. Uh, I don't want to uh, stress Michael out any further. I think I've done that enough <laughs> over the last year anyway. Um, so hello, uh, everyone. Good afternoon for you in South Asia. And it's a good morning for us here in Europe. Uh, my name is Emma Brendan, and I'm a senior lecturer in politics and international relations at the University of West of England. And um, my work is in, I'm a social scientist, I would say, and my work is in the intersection of gender studies, international relations, security studies, and Kashmir studies. Uh, so working on this project uh, has made me curious about how children living in co context are immersed in long-term conflict, systematic state violence, in the form of occupation and settler colonialism, what they tell us about the lives of children in Kashmir. And my, my analysis is, is mainly based on the arts productions created by the children during the activities that we heard about already, uh, such as the paintings, the poems, short stories, performances, and sculptures. Maida, please, God sake. Excuse me? I think there was some <laughs> interference there. Uh, so, uh, and my project, so as a social scientist, I'm looking at this data from a quite uh, different perspective from the previous speakers. Uh, and so and my project and my research is framed around some key questions. So how do children, children express themselves and their lives uh, through the artwork? What are, what are the articulations of children's agency? Where is resistance? And how can this knowledge contribute to the study of peace and conflict? Um, so um, I'm basing my research, my this, this specific research project around uh, three kind of key theory, theoretical um, areas. So the first one is around ch children, and, children and childhood, uh, where I'm using post-colonial and fem critical feminist scholarship to help, uh, which can help us understand uh, children's lives without upholding either an idealized notion of childhood as universal or unitary, um, um, which can reinforce binaries about what is a good childhood or bad childhood, but I want us to understand that childhood is constructed, contextual, identical. And, um, and this brings me into the area of agency. And here we look, uh, I think, uh, we're also using a more of a post-structural or critical perspectives of agency. I'm going, going beyond the idea of agency, just focus on the individual, but also ag that in the agency is something that is happening in relations to, uh, in relations between individuals, but also in relations to the context, uh, in, in, in relation to history, in, the, in, in, in uh, relations to institutions. I'm, inter in, I'm interested in agency as both uh, in its role in forming identity, subjectivity, everyday experiences, but also agency and in its relationship to resistance. 
Um, so here we think about resistance as everyday resistance, working from James C. Scott and kind of and later uh, theorizations by, for instance, Johansson and Windhagen. Uh, we can see everyday resistance as a pattern of acts uh, or practice. So here we can think about res resistance as a force that undermines or destabilizes uh, or kind of trying to go beyond power. So creating other ways of life and ways of being. So also again, this connection both between the individual sense of self, subjectivity, but also uh, kind of an in relationship to uh, infrastructures, institutions, context, histor histories. Um, so in order to make sense of the artwork, uh, uh, I divide them into themes and um, where, which hopefully can help us to explore different constructions, mobilizations, and dispersals of children's agency and resistance. And these themes are gendered violence, the environment, and betrayal and violence. Um, so firstly then, uh, so for each of these themes, I've chosen one artwork that I feel uh, talks specifically about this, uh, about this theme. And of course, uh, there's, uh, the, the children has, have produced a large amount of work. So, um, so I'm not saying that one, this specific piece of work is representative or, uh, uh, or it's the only one or it's generalizable, but it kind of it demonstrates one expression within these themes. Uh, so this painting is uh, by a student that we have nick anonymized or nicknamed as Ifra, and it's accompanied by a story by, by a story that tells about a woman who has experienced discrimination and racism throughout her life. And as this mistreatment has worsened, she gave birth to a baby girl. And this, but however, despite this hardship that she has endured, she has she has kept standing up for herself. And, but despite standing up for herself, the, dis, the, the situation became more difficult, the discrimination got worse until she got support from an army of women. And the, uh, the student writes, all kinds of women got together and achieved this great process, achieved this great success. And now they're preparing for another battle and they believe that they can overcome anything, anywhere at all cost, costs, women empowerment. So I think this is um, interesting exploration of both of different forms of gender violence or gender, gender oppression uh, that occurs uh, and circulates possibly in the everyday life of, uh, of the children, uh, but also uh, demonstrates an awareness or a, maybe a growth of a feminist consciousness. And this is a feminist consciousness that is built on ideas uh, around, um, or a, on solidarity, on relations, and on um, and on mutuality, right? So just move on then quickly to the environment. Um, so these are um, so here on the left. First, you can see uh, one of the paper sculptures produced by Masrat. And here we can see a landscape that is produced in newspapers and other, other forms of paper. And in the video that it follows this sculpture, uh, Mustard presents a narrative about a butterfly. It's so similar as we heard in the previous video. Uh, but in, in, in this specific story, the butterfly is worried about the environment because of the humans. And she ponders of the destruction by humans and what will happen. And uh, when feeling worried or upset, this butterfly flies to, a, flies to a park to drink from the nectar, which seems to soothe and support and uh, build resilience uh, within this butterfly. And, uh, and then on the right here, you see a poem uh, by Zishan. Um, the earth is warming up, the water is rising, the houses are getting drowned, the clouds are tired. The warming is heating up my mind more than it does to the globe. Um, and here, I think here, I think these here we can see in this theme we can see both um, a strong contextualization, both in a very local or regional um, uh, historical context and 
current political context in terms of uh, in the poll the the, in the poem by Zijan, the mentioning of the houses that are getting drowned, that which may refer to the, store, uh, to the floods that happened in Kashmir in 2014, but also connects to um, uh, the larger debates on, um, on uh, uh, cl climate change and global warming. And um, so we can see here there's, uh, there's, a con there's a building on the one hand, possibly, of an individual kind of individual environmentalist uh, consciousness of political engagement in or uh, political commentary on uh, major issues happening going on both locally and regionally in Kashmir, but also uh, globally. Um, but also, um, um, but I think it was, and, and, it, and it kind of creates, it creates some kind of uh, conditions for resistance against, um, uh, I would say some of the, some of the kind of, some of the, um, I can't find the word, I lost my thought. Uh, resistance against some of the kind of, the, um, Okay, I'll leave that point because I forgot what I was going to say. Um, so moving on then to the final theme and uh, betrayal and violence. Uh, so this is uh, taken from the puppet theater, Prince of Egypt that Anurupa and Vikram were talking about before, uh, which um, contain various themes around, uh, around family, betrayal, uh, um, power and uh, rulership and, um, which um, and it's set in this in Egypt in a kind of a magical fairyland with uh, spirits, uh, magical bottles, uh, and magic. So it's on. Um, so it's located somewhere else, far away from far away from Kashmir. The the the, the political uh, situation in Kashmir, um, and set kind of, so set in this fairy tale. Uh, metaphoric state. Um, so it's, uh, and I think it's an interesting, it's interesting to look at this and wonder, think, thinking, of, thinking again about its kind of connection to how, what are, what type of forms of agency are articulated here? Are these, um, are these, um, these productions, a commentary on the political situation set in a far off world, as uh, Anurupa and Vikram already mentioned, are the commentaries on things that um, maybe cannot be spoken about. And so narratives that cannot be talked about in this specific conflict that are coming through here. Um, so just to move on then uh, to some concluding Thoughts. I think it's important to remember that this artwork is produced in a specific context. So both in terms of it's uh, in, in, in this context of the art, art, arts activities in this program, and it's taking place in relationship with the school, uh, in, um, in relationship with the parents and extended family, uh, arts therapists uh, in the UK research team, and the various power relations, both in terms of India-Kashmir relations and the North-South relations. So this specific context is setting, um, is of course both creating the foundation and the environment or the, uh, for where the various forms of articulations of agency are taking place uh, at the same time as they also of course setting kind of limitations of what is um, what is being said. Um, so we, we can see the agency um, we can, uh, here can possibly takes place as articulations of different types of identities, so create different forms, uh, for instance, feminist identities, environmentalist identities. I haven't spoken about some other kind of everyday youth identities that are being uh, articulated in this video. So there are that talks about fano Korean pop and pizza and pasta. Um, and here, and this subjectivity is uh, 
um, that is being produced, and this is our different signs of um, resistance. And, um, and this brings to four some other everyday experiences that, uh, that come out the other themes that already mentioned, the so themes around loneliness, for instance, in the Lonely Boy video, gender inequality in many of these communities. Um, but it also raises questions around silences and in terms of what is not being said in, uh, in the arts productions. And of course, here, this relates back to the context, it relates back to institutions, and um, and it raises question, questions, of course, to what extent uh, can agency and what types of agency, what types of resistance can be articulated uh, in, in the framework of, uh, of a specific project like this one. So I will stop there before uh, um, I go on talk too, talking for too long. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, that's really fascinating and very helpful. Um, a great summary of, of the analysis that, that you're undertaking and some nice images about some of the, some of the work that the, the children did. Um, <clears throat> I was really impressed with some of the uh, being able to look at the data um, and look at the, the discussions and um, just the, the sort of the everyday uh, um, experiences that we were able had access to. Uh, was really uh, heartwarming, really, <clears throat> to learn about the children uh, further. Um, does anyone have any real quick questions? Emma, you can stop sharing. Um, does anyone have any real quick questions for Emma and, and before we move on um, to the next speaker? We have two speakers remaining. Uh, <clears throat> and maybe I'll ask, maybe since we're closing down on time, that you maybe send uh, send your questions into chat, and I'll ask uh, Emma to to respond that way while we while we um, while we uh, get set up, uh, if that's okay. Um, in the meanwhile, I'll ask uh, Lopa to uh, see if I can uh, find you. Um, so we have two more speakers, and Lopa um, is, um, was working as the the principal for the Dolphin School. Our partners there, and we'll speak to that again. Lopa, just keep it, keep an eye on the um, on the time if you can, if you've got uh, uh, that that in mind. Um, I'll just turn it directly over to you, and we just keep keep plugging away. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I will try and keep to time, um, and I will directly jump into the meeting. Uh, I mean, the, the presentation. My name is Lopa. Um, I identify. Can you see the presentation? Sorry, Michael. Can you check this for me? Uh, it's loading still. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. My name is Lopa, and I identify as a facilitator in education. And today, I speak with you specifically in the capacity of a researcher, a practice-based observant researcher uh, of out of healing the project Kalakar Kaspa on ground. Um, so the title of the project is, um, or the research report is Schools for Change. And the title essentially uh, comes from my role as an institution in leader, uh, as the principal of Dolphin International School. Um, and so it is from the perspective of uh, institutions and systems uh, of education that exist in, a, in spaces of conflict. Um, essentially, within that framework, I want to uh, elaborate on disruption and design in conflict today from the lens of an outside insider. And I say this because um, I do not I do not belong to Kashmir originally. I, I'm a resident of Gujarat and I've moved to Kashmir specifically for working with the school and with children uh, and to build on my practice as a designer in education. And I see this as an attempt of building um, towards strengthening systems of education. Um, so um, this just gives a description of who I am. As a practitioner, I also advocate disrupting to construct an education for conflict and crisis. And I'll tell you why in the next slide. Um, I mean, the context has been set beautifully and exhaustively by every everybody today. And so I'm going to directly zoom in and jump into summing up and into the specifics of schools as systems and their lives. Um, <clears throat> So the disruption that a lot of people mentioned 
the violence, the disruption in the valley uh, of routines and infrastructures leads to a lot of patterns being built up. Uh, certain causes of, I mean, it causes alienation, um, which then leads into unclear um, foresight for students, teachers, and residents of Bali in general. Um, violence has become normality, and because of which, um, the opportunities for realizing your potential uh, becomes become lesser, and hence there's unrealized potential and low sense of self. Um, erasure and cancellation of narratives, identities, entities uh, altogether has happened over the years and which has resulted into um, destructive resistance uh, and further into more violence and the loop sort of continues. Um, and essentially from what I've heard from people speaking and uh, from my perspective, the collective consensus I'm assuming is that along with other things, there is a strong need to build constructive resilience as a skill among students. Uh, and briefly, what constructive resilience means is uh, to be able to find creative ways to uh, build a just and vibrant life amidst uh, systematic and um, often violent oppression. Uh, now, why I'm highlighting disruption and construction is uh, is because there is because of so much being built because of disruptive routines. There needs a special kind of design, which is disruptive re design, needed um, to respond. Uh, and what does that mean? What are the things that we that I advocate on disrupting? Uh, I mentioned here, for example, social normative behavior. Um, behavior that are uh, that is established as a cultural practice because or in response to or resilience to violence uh, which may or may not be uplifting um, personal inhibitions again due to a lot of restrictions um, set learning patterns unrenewed teaching practices a because of alienation and lack of exposure b um, because of uh, demotivation about um, you know, pushing yourselves to learn further. Mm, locked emotions and perspectives, very few spaces uh, which are safe enough to, to express exist and hence emotions get locked and perspe perspectives get uh, influenced. Uh, ideas of discipline are very tightly associated with regimentation because that is the example that exists on the streets uh, in the system around them and hence that's what gets translated within uh, family systems and school systems as well. Uh, nature of student uh, teacher relationship also then becomes hierarchical, uh, not friendly, uh, sometimes oppressive. Uh, narratives of self and other get created based on the, um, the narratives that are built by the larger ecosystem, which is the media, um, the center, the rest of the country, uh, the talks that happen on the dinner table uh, and on television, on the screens. Uh, perception on utilities of education, this is closely linked with how the parents also see children and, and their journeys of education, uh, which is limited because uh, the, the aspiration is towards uh, achieving certain sense of security and security comes with known ways of doing things rather than the unknown and hence the utility, utility of education is perceived limitedly. Um, and hence the, the intervention of design is required to construct resilience through action. Uh, so to be able to build yourself up against the uh, violence, but also to push to build stronger um, spaces for yourself where you can thrive and uplift other people as well. Um, environments of safety, uh, informed narratives of self and the other. By informed, we we mean that we, we dig deeper, we inquire, and we try and inform ourselves beyond what is fed to us through the through the media and through the general discourse of violence. Uh, sense of belonging and ownership, the, the most uh, uh, silent impact of violence is that that children and people lose their uh, sense of belonging and ownership towards the space when the space is in, in conflict. Um, and that gets translated in their everyday choices of, take, of care uh, when it comes to taking care of their personal bodies or their belongings or their uh, immediate surroundings or their extended surroundings. Um, newer definitions of uh, education need to be uh, constructed, keeping in view the needs of the students specifically impacted by conflicts and showing varied levels of 
um, uh, stress disorders. Alternatives, um, just expanding the horizon of alternatives uh, for goals, for patterns, for practices, for spaces, um, is the need for to construct uh, collective growth. This there is there is definitely a sense of collect community living uh, in the valley. However, the sense of collective growth sort of um, is almost non-existent because uh, although there is there is community living, there's still individual uh, struggle for survival at every point of time. Uh, and hence, when we speak of growth, we sort of become more individual. Um, well-being routines, constructing routines, uh, patterns, and everyday um, channels of well-being, um, I think, comes out also as, a, as an essential three theme through this webinar as well. Um, now, um, what does this, uh, yeah, what does this, this, disruption and construction look like in a school space is what I wanted to highlight here. Um, this grid is, is a grid of choices made by uh, Dolphin International School when I was, I was there. Um, we sort of worked on understanding what, it, what our final goals for the students and teachers were and are uh, in terms of behavior, uh, space, um, and learning and uh, accordingly created a grid of cultures that we wanted to create on campus, which then later helped us choose things that activities that have uh, that happened on campus. Now, the idea of doing this was to be able to do more and more of activities and to also track our choices of activities. Uh, while this was extremely instrumental and helpful, uh, what was missing in, in this was, was a deep-rooted connection with, mm, with the system's uh, or with the school's value system or with the school's uh, vision um, for the students, not for any lack of purpose, not for any uh, lack of intention, but because of the existing circumstances in the valley and because we had to constantly deal with mm, the immediate issues and hence had to sort of sometimes let go of uh, what was long-term intended. Um, uh, so the grid of choices essentially was driven by circumstance. It was not rooted in the system of school as a non-negotiable process. There was, uh, we would push till an extent and then we'd have to give up on pushing for upholding that activity of well-being um, against or as opposed to uh, time given to more academic and rigorous practice. Um, onus of making meaning out of those experiences was on individual student sensibilities um, that the school did offer a lot of opportunities for students to engage in. Uh, what we sort of, uh, we still need to do more is to, to bring the onus back to the students on what uh, on the school on what they take out of the experiences. So to say that the school needs to be responsible for what the students take out of their experiences. Uh, lack of collective acceptance towards well-being programs and collective resilience against circumstantial dropping of the same. By collective, I mean that the, the acceptance and the resist resilience need to be from not just the management, but from every stakeholder on campus, including parents. Uh, and this is where Kalakar Kasba came in absolutely handy and instrumental is, which is out of healing the project, um, that it brought the opportunity for um, widening our imagination of school as a system being an agent of change and not just individuals, but as a system, um, thinking about students' journeys and operating with empathy and design and building champions of constructive resilience who would further go into their communities and replicate the same. Um, uh, so what do we mean by thinking about journey and having empathy? We know that the, that the baseline um, feeling in our children and teachers is, I'm not interested, I want to grow up to fight, or I'm not interested, I want to give up. Uh, because the aspirations are not high enough to make changes. There is dearth of healing spaces. Uh, they're constantly feeling like they're losing out. The political is personal. Um, there is absolute inability to trust uh, in in people or systems. Um, they're driven by fears 
there's also a lot of domestic responsibilities there's peer pressure of course because there's power gaming going on always and there's hazy foresight because when you're trying to only deal with the immediate all the time to be able to survive the moment um there is very little time to 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 really foresee your future and depend on it or to trust that that will all that will one day happen so how does a student see an arts process or how does a uh, school make sure that the student sees their learning uh, journey um, fitting into the, their grander system. Uh, and this is where the research came in handy. Uh, the research that I, that I did was, uh, it, it brought the opportunity of bringing the world in on our design that, uh, that this, this idea of doing it individually uh, was breaking in our heads and we, we realized that as a system, if we wanted to create a container, as uh, the artists mentioned, uh, we needed to bring uh, more people, experts, perspectives into our design uh, and then showcase a prototype. So this project essentially became a prototype for the school to, um, uh, to advocate more projects like these for the school and for other schools as well and really model uh, this kind of practice. Um, and also for me personally, as a researcher and as a facilitator in education, building discourse on design-led education in response to conflict and crisis with central focus being well-being um, came out as a strong, strong uh, tool through the research. Um, and so what do we mean by building a prototype is essentially saying what I experience here is what I want to create later. And this is also coming from one of the students uh, who at the end of the project did say um, that everything that he'd learned over, over time in the project, he would like more people to learn and hence he would like to be the representative or the facilitator of the same, which was very, very uplifting for the school to hear. Um, um, so how do, how do students feel about what they do? Um, how, how can school really keep feedback uh, close uh, and make it inevitable? Uh, how do we talk about it and together co-build and learn? Um, how do we also design for extending these models, make a network to hold each other? And how, how do we see ourselves as a collective, as a system which is a part of a larger collective and that we all hold together and stand together? Um, some of the key questions that the school was asking or I was asking as the principal and as the researcher through the school, through the project, um, are uh, uh, about higher stakes on personal well-being. Uh, what, after the research, what has been informed to the school um, is, that, is that the school itself needs to really invest in putting higher stakes on personal well-being um, right at the onset of, onset of students' admission on campus. Um, and that how can arts-based therapy sessions be part of the student's regular learning practice and not just one-off things or on and off things that they do as a side activity, uh, as mentioned by some of the speakers earlier as well. Um, how can then the student-teacher relationship also be strengthened by finding um, the tools um, that worked through this project? So a lot of tools that worked um, are, are very essential um, in even classroom practices. And just like the artists were mentioning, there is all the more need for helping more and more teachers or training more teachers to be able to use the same uh, within their classrooms. Uh, how can the arts, arts program be steered not just by the art teacher, but by the students themselves? This was again a collective feeling that came out of um, the students participating in the project that they really wanted to be the art um, facilitators eventually for the campus and for other people outside. They also started a collective project uh, along the same lines. And that how can artistic facil facilitation assessment uh, realized through the project be used for the larger uh, system of the schooling? For example, the six PSM tool, um, say how does something like that 
by the school to create a data of, um, of, of students coping mechanisms and then work through that in order to support and help the child and respond to the child's needs. Um, and all of these quest questions essentially uh, point at my research question, which was why and how schools and regions of high volatility and conflict can institutionalize arts as a process of social inclusion and constructive resilience. Um, the design of the research was, of course, uh, a lot to do with what happens practically and what can happen when, but essentially to investigate how children understand and articulate their uh, individual and collective social space through the arts, uh, how we can build frameworks for teachers in order to learn uh, and to to, to build children's aesthetic, social, and personal skills, to negotiate with emotions, how um, to investigate how parents uh, respond to the arts programs and how we can uh, sort of influence that and how that influences students' performance and sense of self. Uh, also develop ways in which all of this can be documented and evaluated and reimagine the purpose of implementing this kind, uh, these kind of programs in the school. So a lot of questions that were also coming about how uh, these things can happen in say an NGO or an, an organization working on ed education in Kashmir. Mm, essentially the, uh, the thing to do or question to ask is how do you imagine education um, or arts in education as a tool uh, facilitating a system? Um, so what is the real learning for the school? Um, very quickly, um, acceptance that the arts acts as a powerful tool for transforming selves and spaces. And this, there is evidence in the paper that I've written and the papers that other, others have written uh, also of this. Um, understanding scaling that, uh, that this is sustainable only if teachers, more and more teachers are equipped with the tools to work with, with children on it. Uh, and this has been learned by the school by, in a hard way, by teachers having dropped out of the project uh, because they couldn't perceive uh, the utility, utility as much and because the school couldn't hold them um, as much. Uh, policy shifts that the, the school needs to take high responsibility in making sure that well-being becomes a non-negotiable on campus for children in, at risk. Including parents at, as active stakeholders, this is something that uh, we realize is, is we, something we need to still work on as a school and more, more schools need to be working on is um, really including parents in, in the journey of, journeys of learning. Systems thinking, of course, that we see education not as what happens in the classroom only, but as a larger system that, may, that creates a support system for, for, a, for learning to happen wherever it does. Vision building, that the school can help students construct dreams uh, and, uh, uh, and strengthen resilience. Also modeling that by, by rooting itself in this vision, by, if the school roots itself in this vision strongly and does more of it, that they'll be able to become models for uh, the idea of transformation that it advocates. Um, what does this impact look like in reality for children? Really just, I put together just three examples of what children have said. Um, art was just a part of my school. Now it's a way of life for me. I see the world through colors. Mm. This is the kind of capacity building that, that we are envisioning um, or that I'm speaking about or advocating about when I say school creating a support system for a child to feel uplifted. Uh, I'm more imaginative now. It's like earlier I saw a plain room. Now I see colors of opportunities in it. Uh, I'll let you read the third one on your own. Um, yeah, so just to conclude, I um, would say um, well-being of students and the system of education in high impact regions like Pulwama continues to be an ongoing conversation, particularly in the academic and advocacy circles. Uh, my report concludes with a stronger conviction that institutionalizing the arts as a process of holistic education for regions in conflict and crisis can be established as a practice if more schools identified the potential and saw the length of transformation it offers. Kalakar Kasba's work at Dolphin was a significant beginning for the school and for me. With this, I say thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lopa, and, and uh, <clears throat> apologies for, for pushing things along. Um, <clears throat> it's really fa fantastic and a real great summary of, of, of the work and your research and some of the impacts. Uh, really was inspired by the, the, the quotes that I read in your larger 
uh, report about the impact on, on children. I'm going to ask people to, if you have questions, to put them into the chat and, and, um, and Lopa will, 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 will type some answers when, um, when, as, she, as she goes along. I have one final speaker, which we'll, we'll, we will go a few minutes over, um, over 12, which I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, um, but um, but so so Julie, you'll have the full fifteen minutes um, allocated, uh, and then anyone who wants to hang around and have a conversation after that is welcome to. Uh, I won't close the. Hopefully, actually, the meeting. Hopefully, the meeting won't just end at noon. <laughs> well, I guess we'll see. Uh, but I'll turn with that sort of urgency. I'll turn it over to, to Julie, um, and uh, and uh, hopefully we will uh, continue. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, Michael. I have actually um, only got a few slides, so I'm hoping that um, this isn't going to take a full 15 minutes at all. Um, Michael, can you just confirm you can see my slides? Yeah, looks good. Great. OK. Um, so um, I'm my name's Julie Mitten. I've I've really enjoyed this morning's presentations. I hope you have too. I'm I'm a professor of public health at the University of the West of England, and my role was to think about um, a theory that underpinned the work that we were doing. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I've just, uh, there we go. So um, the starting point for developing a theory, I was, I thought maybe we should just think about, you know, why do we need to have a theory at all? And it comes down to this point that you need to know whether or not the intervention that you're doing actually works. If your intervention doesn't work in the way that you think it's going to, it's really important you stop doing that intervention. There's a scientific and a moral reason to know that what you think is going to happen is what happens. And when we do research in health and well-being, very often the questions that we ask are really straightforward questions. They're things like, does pill A work better than pill B? And, and if that... I think, I think somebody's got their microphone on. Maybe they could just mute their microphone. That would be great. Thank you. Um, can can that somebody mute their microphone for me? Yeah, I muted it. Marvellous. Thank you, Michael. Um, so... Um, if, you, if you're just comparing one treatment with another, you can do something called a randomized controlled trial where some people get one treatment, some people get another treatment, and you follow them up to see which ones do best. And that works for a lot of what we do in healthcare. But it really doesn't work when you're trying to do a project like the project that we've just done. So what we're trying to do is a social intervention. We're trying to sort of deliver an arts-based intervention in a setting which has a history and a presence of conflict. And we had the additional unexpected challenge of having to do it in the middle of a COVID pandemic. So this is a really complicated and difficult intervention to try to do. And therefore it's just not suitable for doing a trial. And therefore we have to come up with a different way of evaluating and understanding whether or not our intervention works. So what we did was we did something called a realist evaluation. And this is a technique that was developed by two researchers called Pawson and Tilly back in 1997. And the basis of this is it's a circular process of learning. And what you do is you start off by getting your group of researchers and practitioners together and collectively they pool their knowledge to, to create a theory of what they think is going to happen. It's the expected theory of what's going to happen. Then you go and implement your project in a, in a single setting with a small group of people. You're testing it out. You're testing your theory in a, in a particular location. And you collect evidence and you do observations and you collect outputs. And you then compare whether what you observed was what you expected to observe. And that comparison between observed and expected outputs is how you then learn and think about, okay, how do I improve my theory 
so that it becomes generalizable to settings outside of the one in which you did your, your test case. So that was what we were doing in our, in our evaluation and in, in our theory development. So on this slide, which is quite busy and I appreciate that, I don't expect you to read everything here, but this was our initial expected theory. Okay, this is what we thought might happen. So let me just talk you through this slide briefly. So in the blue box at the back, we've got the context in which our project was tested. So this is the context in which the dolphin school is sitting. The green box, which is called mechanism, is the intervention, what we were going to do. And we spent quite a lot of time, we haven't really spoken about how much planning we did to think about what our intervention was gonna look like what it was going to be, what the content of the art-based intervention was going to be, how we were going to support relationships for the children within that intervention, and what resources we were going to have to provide to the children and to the school in order to enable that to happen. And then the pinky, peachy coloured box on the right is what we thought we might see as a consequence of our intervention. So what we hoped was that the experience of participating in the art-based project was going to change the children's perceptions. Those perceptions had the potential to lead to changed behaviours and those changed behaviours had the potential to lead to longer-term outcomes, which included reduced anxiety, um, greater optimism for the future, better engagement in community, in education. So these were our, our, this was our initial theory that we started from. So having developed that initial theory, we then started to work our way around through that cycle that I, I described earlier. So the first thing to do was to develop that intervention. So here we've got um, screenshots of Vikram and Anarupa delivering the, um, the intervention in the, in the initial online phase. And then over the course of the project, we collected all of that evidence that Nicola, for example, told you about um, the draw a man test, the multiple ways of capturing the children's artwork with video and pho photography and uh, installations. We had all of those questionnaires that various people filled out. And we had the reflective report, such as Loper's school reflective report here. So this all amounted to a vast body of evidence, which we could then draw on. We then took that evidence. And what we did was we tried to unpick and work out what had worked, for whom, why, and in what circumstances. So that little blue box there in the bottom right corner of the screen is really the analysis that we did of trying to understand what our observations and package them into a way of understanding how this worked for some of the children. And by doing that analysis, we were then able to come up with a set of observations which we could then compare with our expected observations. So. Let me show you what the output of all of that was. We came up with the understanding that there was an improved sense of belonging of the children by working together in a shared space, which could either be online or it could be, it could be a real space. Those children were able to explore their feelings when they had been given choices and time and resources to do so by being involved in activities that didn't involve talking, we started to help those children to express themselves. By sharing their artistic creations, they became more confident. By supporting each other, particularly the older artists in the collective, supporting the younger artists in the collective, they started to develop leadership skills. They developed peer relationships through the activity of doing group-based activities, and they developed relationships with adults through working with Anarupa and Vikram as, as consistent role models over a long period of time. 
And importantly, the school environment was absolutely crucial to all of this happening, because what we realised was that the relationship between the school, the families and the children was fundamental to letting the children participate, um, getting the family permission to do so and enabling the school to be able to, to achieve its ambitions. So we have now been able to take that knowledge and go back and we are now working on our more generalizable theory that we have emer has emerged out of this work. And we're gonna publish our findings so that it's more available both to scientists and to practitioners. And then we hope to use that knowledge to both apply to more for more funding, but also to start being able to roll out the intervention in a larger number of schools. And what we'll do through that process is continuously improve our knowledge of why this is such a helpful intervention for children who are living in such difficult circumstances. So thank you very much, everybody. That's my last slide, Michael. Uh, um, thanks, Julie. Um, it's a really great summary of how we approach the theory of change. You also have a very calm way of speaking, which I appreciate. You've calmed, you've calmed me down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to stop sharing. I'm struggling to stop sharing. Um, um, oh, here we go. Stop share. There we go. Out. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so it's now noon, and that's when I said we would end. So of course, there are people who had to go, and that's completely understandable. Um, <clears throat> what Julie has done right there is really summarize how we're trying to make a complete sense of this and and be able to summarize our theory of change uh, in taking together all these great pieces of work that people have been doing so it's a really um it's a it's a it's a it gives us a a hypothesis of sort of what we wanted to accomplish but then also really summarizes takes together all the other bits and pieces that we've been been looking at so um and our our hope is is that we have something that we can stand behind and say this is this is the kind of changes that that you can expect, or this is what we found, and 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 so on. So um, that was that was really great. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna open open this up for if anyone has any questions. First of all, for Julie and what her, her, her specific approach, or Emma or Lopa, who who got sort of slightly short short uh, period of, of of comments and questions. Um, um, but so if anyone has any questions, do put your hand up or turn your mic on. And then if you if you have um, more general comments or suggestions, then we'll, we'll we'll open that up. But maybe just does anyone have a question for, for what Julie just presented or um, anything they would like to add to that? I see something in the chat. Which, uh, would it be possible to receive the recording? Yes. Um, so the um, the recording will go on the website as soon as I can. You know, it's probably going to be like a, a very big file. I might have to do some editing to bring it down so people can look at it. And it'll be on our website. I'll ask the admin team to email everyone when that's when that's complete, so you'll get a notification. But it shouldn't shouldn't take too long. So everything will be on on the website. Um, <clears throat> yep. Um, yeah. And and uh, J.K. There, I agree completely that um, it's, it's my objective to, to do this kind of activity um, on a wider, much wider scale. So, you know, <clears throat> critically important and valuable. So what we're, what I think what we're trying to do here is, is to give a diversity of um, uh, confidence that, that you can trust in this work and that it's meaningful and that the arts play have a, have a particularly important role to play and that it should be supported um, to help uh, in these contexts. Um, right. So I'm officially sort of saying go, please. Um, it's, it's noon, take off. Uh, so, um, so I want to make sure you're comfortable with that and you can, you can go. Um, <clears throat> I'll turn the spotlight light off of, of Julie. And then if, if anyone has any, wants to have an open discussion um, at, at all, if anyone feels like they didn't get a chance to say a key point from their own presentation, or if they just want to say something else, um, please, please do. Um, I'll just give a, be quiet for a moment. Um, the, the recording will be saved. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, um, I, I'm not sure if it will remain on Zoom forever. Michael, there was quite a long question from Matilia to, um, to Lopa in the chat. 
Okay. Oh yeah, I see that. Lopa, if you have a, if you can um, take a look at that. Um, I don't want to read the whole the whole thing, but maybe you can see the question and summarize and. You'll have to unmute yourself as well. Yeah, um, meaning, uh, <laughs> uh, I generally uh, we we laugh about this on campus as a as a team, but um, we all know that uh, we 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 may not be able to follow the plan that we make, but we don't stop making plans. Uh, however, instead of one plan or one timeline, we have at least two timelines for contingency. Uh, I think it keeps our brains uh, active. It also helps us realize that um, it's, it's, it's important to also let go of what you plan because the circumstance makes us do it. So we sort of, we see it positively and I think that's what gets translated with our children. What we try to do is make sure that um, we, we keep doing what we're doing. We keep the work consistent. Um, even if it gets delayed, it, it sort of still happens so that there's a sense of continuity, at least in that sense for the students. Thank you. I think Atelier has a has a has a um, follow up question, possibly. Did your hand up? Yeah. Hi, Lopa. I got the answer from you. I want to know that how do you, you know, even uh, manage doing this uh, and, you know, living under such uncertainty in Kashmir? How do you manage, you know, taking forward the plan, whatever you planned? Uh, I think you just spoke about it. Thanks. I mean, <laughs> It's tough yeah. planning anything in Kashmir and taking it forward uh, due to political yeah. uncertainty. And it's not just uh, something that I do. I think all of us do. You do too, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm based in, uh, I'm based out of Gurgaon. I'm an art therapist. But yeah, uh, let me just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Lopa. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yeah, so I was, I wanted to know that, uh, don't you feel like since you work, you might have worked in other parts of India, don't you think children of Kashmir you know, have, are more patient, they need more endurance, they are more, they have to endure a lot, right? As compared to children of wherever, rest of the world, because uh, they live in conflict, conflict sure. zone. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Patience is a, is a skill, it's a virtue, yes. Um, I would say children in Kashmir have had matured experiences and hence they, um, they mature faster, maybe. Um, whether they are patient or not is, is actually, subjective also i want to know that uh, since whatever happens in kashmir um, i mean when we were growing up in 90s art as a subject was just re removed from the school i wanted to know that does your school still continue with art as a subject even right now because of pandemic lockdown a lot of schools in kashmir have just removed art and music as subjects uh, focusing on other academic subjects because everything is happening online the you know school is happening online so they would not prefer rather giving art classes to the children and just give other subjects like right? they would just rather remove art and music yeah uh, as a school we are trying to to push for uh, more space for arts no matter what uh, because we want to communicate that we see arts not just as a subject but as a tool for building a, a stronger sense of self and a happier life for everybody in response to the impact of violence so we are trying to push that those so the art is still happening online. It's not been removed. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. Also, I want to know if Vikram could get in touch. I don't know how to get in touch with Vikram. Vikram sorry. Is Vikram there? Yeah. Um. I can. I put his. Uh. His. His email here. Do you, Vikram, yes, you just type. Type your email in the yes, chat. Yes, please. That would help. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, everybody. Um. Yeah. So is there is there another um any other questions i know some people have to go so we're gonna we are going to wrap up um in a few minutes but uh radifa yes. seems like you have your microphone open are you do you have a question yes, collapse, collapse, collapse. Uh, collapse. i don't know exactly what just happened there um <laughs> okay um Anyone else want to um, to say anything else? <laughs> it, um, 
it's been really lovely to 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 be a part of it. And I'm sure you know when we do these um, presentations, the beauty of what the children actually did. It doesn't. It's not maybe as present as I kind of. I, I kind of. There were some videos I actually cried watching some of the videos that the that the children uh, created. So it really is uh, inspiring. Really, really inspiring. Um, so yeah, thank you for 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 allowing us to do this and for for pulling it all together. Um, I just want to say, Michael, thank you for leading this project because it's been a complex project in the middle of a pandemic um, with all sorts of issues uh, because of that. And I think it's gone incredibly well. So I, I, I feel you had the vision to do it and to take us through to this conclusion, which I think is fantastic, particularly as it's going to be, uh, as we're going to be trying to make it transferable. I think that's so important. Yeah, it's great. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Well okay. said, Rain, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's a really great summary and final event for our funded research project. But of course, the collaborations aren't going to end. And um, we, I think we've created a nice foundation for working together. I hope any of the people who have participated today, the participants and, and who have listened, if you have any questions, just e e email us. Um, and, uh, and stay in touch, have a look at the website. Uh, happy, we're happy to see what other collaborations we, we might make. We're all interested in doing more of this and, um, and, and, and learning about your experiences as well. So, you know, apologies for running a, a, a bit over, over time, but um, <clears throat> I think I'll go have some food and, and relax. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Hi, hi everyone. I, think I'll end I it just there. want to end up this with this. I'm from Kashmir and I'm a teacher at uh, Delhi Public School, Srinagar. I teach class two. And Go on. Uh, I had this workshop with uh, Vikramji, and it was a lovely workshop. We all uh, teachers sat together for hours and we did tremendously well. And, uh, you know, it was like an eye opener for me. I told this thing uh, to the Vikram the same day. And, you know, the theater thing he brought in the stage on the stage was lovely. And I wanted to work with the theater actually, but seeing you with, I think working with you all and looking this at Miss Lopa and Lorraine, Michael, and you, everyone, you are all amazing. I think I have to learn. I'm just a learner. And uh, I was shocked so much detailing, so much uh, uh, connections you have made with each other, Emma and everyone there. Uh, and uh, this is lovely. And I had the uh, fun time because I think I was in a learning session and some of the things were very difficult to understand because uh, the love for theater is something else. And the way you have done, you have started from the scratch and you have just carried it to an, another level. So I have to work harder to just be a participant like every one of you. Amazing, tremendous, tremendous. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, thank you for, for those kind words. That's, that's really nice to hear. Um, it really is quite amazing how it all worked together and <laughs> how we all came together. Um, it is pretty fascinating. Um, thank you. I can't really explain it, to be honest, but <laughs> <laughs> um, really great collection of people. Um, I really appreciate that. And thank you for that, Rihanna. Um, okay. I think I will, I, I might actually press end on the meeting, um, unless yeah. anyone else wants to say how wonderful we are. <laughs> you are, you don't need any explanation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's been, it's been really great. I, again, uh, look forward to, to an email, maybe announcing that you can have a look at the, uh, the, the video and also it'll be on our website and then be other sort of stuff or just send an email if you want to stay in touch. Um, um, that would be that would be great. I can also I think my my email has been um, been sent around, but I guess I'll also put it in the chat. Let's put it there. You're welcome to email me if you have any further questions or comments or or what whatever. Uh, okay, thank you everyone. That was really thank great. You. I really appreciate it, and um, see you soon. Bye, Vikram. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everything. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye, Emma. Bye, Lorraine. Bye, Vikram. Pressing end. Bye, Julie. See you.